Once, a powerful red dragon sought revenge against humanity for the slaughter of its kin. However, its ambitions crumbled in a decisive battle, leaving only bitterness and hatred in its heart. As it took its final breath, it believed its vengeance would remain unfulfilled. Unexpectedly, it was reborn as a helpless human baby, a cruel twist of fate that defied all expectations. He didn't think the puny humans had it in them, but they finally did it. They defeated him, taking down the only legendary red dragon in the world. With their full force, the humans surrounded the beast, in the back of their formation. A mysterious and unknown witch evidently led them. The witch redirected their attacks to focus on the weak points of the monster. He was taken aback by just how many competent people were in the ranks of the humans this time around. They got the whole squad kitted out with full sets of armaments, bro. It's over. With a resolute shout, the witch declared the end for the monstrous being. In the eyes of every human on the battlefield, this was the end the behemoth deserved. Hearing this, he couldn't help but fall into deep thought. Did he really deserve this end? He had never stepped into human territory even once. Quite the opposite, in fact. Over the past millennia, humans had attacked him over and over again, sacrificing their own flesh and blood. A massive explosion, followed by an earth-shattering rumble, shook the entire terrain surrounding the woods. And in the end, he was slain. Perhaps it was due to old age, but he had no recollection of the details leading up to his final stand. All he could remember were flocks of humans hunting him down and tracking his den. Left within the fragments of his memory were nothing but memories of humans appearing out of nowhere, attacking everyone he cared about for absolutely no reason whenever he found somewhere he could call home. That's just messed up, bro. The humans used everything at their disposal, whether it was magic, strength, or blades. Every single mighty dragon fell to their sheer numbers and force. They killed his friends, they wiped out his family. They displayed and paraded the heads and corpses of everyone he cared about as trophies of their brutality. That crosses the line, my guy. They're out here hunting endangered species. That was until he had finally had enough. With a furious roar, a massive flame erupted from his mouth, incinerating everything in sight. He had become the last dragon in existence. He had nothing to his name and no one to lose. Displayed in his eyes was a pure desire for vengeance. Revenge was the only thing keeping him alive. It was just as those humans said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But now, all of that was behind him. Surrounded by the human forces he hated the most, he could finally rest his eyes in his tired body. The last legendary red dragon had fallen. Rest in peace, man. You were a real one. In his slumber, he heard a sweet voice calling out affectionately. At the end of the dark abyss, a bright and blinding light drew closer and closer to him. All he could feel was utter confusion. At the other end of the light, from the abyss, he laid eyes upon a human smiling brightly while admiring something or someone adorable. Once he realized what was going on, the man was already beaming with joy as he squeezed and held a tiny, delightful baby in his arms. From fearsome to adorable, that's a glow-up in my book. It was as if the world stood still for the legendary red dragon as goosebumps covered his small body. Ro turned into a Baki character for a moment. The big question in his mind was why he was being held by a human. All he knew was he had to leave this place as soon as possible. He tried to feel for his wings, but they were nowhere in sight. On the outside, he resembled a normal infant throwing a tantrum, but on the inside, he dreaded the possibility that he might have just become a human. The man celebrated in front of his wife, proudly declaring that the baby liked him. The dragon inside the newborn couldn't take this humiliation. He wanted this filthy human to let him go at once. He deemed that since this man had a death wish for humiliating him, he would gladly grant it. He intended to burn this man to a crisp and show them just who they were messing with. On the outside, he resembled a baby trembling bizarrely, leaving the man and the woman in bed clueless as to what was happening. After supposedly finishing storing his fiery power, he released it in the form of spit. His destructive dragon breath was now just a tiny glob of spittle. I'm going to go try this dragon breath out myself. The man was taken aback by the baby's actions, while the dragon questioned just what had happened to his once monumental magic. In his mind, the sweet words of the woman who was about to pick him up were simply terrifying. The hands of a larger human than him scared him immensely. This was truly hell for him. The beautiful woman was simply welcoming him to this new life, and from now on, he will be known as Ray. He thinks that Ray is such a laughable human name, and he's still not clear about what is happening and what welcome she means. These humans have no idea who he really is. Inside this tiny vessel is the legendary red dragon remaining in the world. He does not have that dog in him. He has a whole dragon instead. Suddenly, he felt like everything clicked. If the heavens have allowed him, 
the mighty red dragon, to be born again. He'll have the chance to fulfill his wishes of revenge. Just like what they did to his brethren, the dragon kind, with this new human body of his, he vowed to kill every single human. A tooth for a tooth, an eye for an eye. Bro is about to grow up as a literal menace to society. The infant laughed deviously as the man found it peculiar that such a small newborn looks so devious and naughty. He has a sneaking suspicion that this baby is going to be a lot of trouble. But no matter what happens, this is their child. This is their beloved baby. Ray's tiny brain was filled with delusions of killing everyone. Suddenly, he was struck with the feeling of his eyelids getting heavy. He was getting sleepy. He had become so tired as he spent all his energy controlling his mouth. As he drifted off to dreamland, he criticized the human body for being so incredibly weak. Planning for humanity's annihilation while needing a baby nap is crazy. Opening his eyes to a wide blue sky and the refreshing air of nature, time flew by. It has been quite a while since Ray became a human, and he has learned a great deal of new things regarding mankind. Now, he even knows what his parents are called. Calling them long hair and short hair would not be very specific, after all. His parents' names are Scarlet and Jake, respectively. They seem to have better looks than other humans. Scarlet's beautiful face also complements her kind and gentle personality. While this human male called Jake has much more muscle than other humans, and he seems significantly stronger as well. He got those good genetics on lock. It seems like today they have visitors coming to the house. His parents politely let them in and greeted them. The nearby villagers would always visit them, treating them with utmost respect. One of the visiting villagers praised Mr. Talon, also known as Jake, for his remarkable swordsmanship that saved the villager's wife in the Black Forest. They also praised Scarlet for being formidable as well. Even if you looked hard, you would not be able to find a second mage within a hundred mile radius, at the very least. This couple really is a match made in heaven. The kind Scarlet humbly responded to such high praise as the husband and wife insisted that they only did what anyone else would have done, and the most important thing is that everyone is safe and sound. They are being treated so highly because they are what humans call adventurers. Scarlet noticed her baby crawling on the floor and she can instantly tell that this little guy was getting hungry. The villagers praise Ray for being such an intelligent child. Kids his age usually cannot ask for food by themselves when they get hungry. They also noticed that Ray's hair seems a little red. Maybe it's because of the lighting or maybe it's due to something else. According to Jake, it looks like he started to grow red hair for some reason a few days ago. Inside Ray's mind, he celebrated the growth of his red hair. This fiery hair color probably means that he still has some of his powers left behind. Dragon form incoming. And just like that, the visitors politely bid their farewell as they head out of the door. They left with a request from Jake to chase the beasts away from their farms, and the always dependable guy reassured them that it will be taken care of by him personally. Right after getting out of the Talon house, the villagers started to gossip with each other. One of them asked if it seems like the Talon family has been cursed. They think that it would not be out of the realm of possibility. Not everyone can become an adventurer, after all. And who knows just what kinds of dangers they have been through. Trash-talking the good guys whom you just asked for a favor right after walking out the door is crazy. Ray heard all of this and interpreted it as the humans fearing his red hair. He gloated that his grand presence intimidated them effectively. His mom picked him up as she gently lifted him to the feeding table. This mother and father of his confuse him the most. No matter how savagely he eats, no matter what he does, they never get angry at him and he has tried extremely hard to make them. One day, he tried to pee directly into his father, Jake's mouth while he was sleeping. After the initial shock of being awakened by the taste of urine, he laughed and smiled it off as he lifted his beloved son. This little boy is a top-tier prankster. He's just like me. For real. He even praised him for being a genius. To think that he already knows how to pee by himself at his early age, it's impressive. Next time, they'll have to work on peeing in the toilet, though. Jake and Scarlet took care of his every need and loved him unconditionally every single day. If hell existed, this would be it for him. Scarlet Talon is an incredibly gifted water mage who can bend water to her will. Adventurers are already rare in this world, and Ray's mother is a mage, a type of adventurer even rarer. She looks like a Ganshin Impact character, bro. If he were to successfully get a hold of the strongest magic in this world in the future, his bloody and fiery revenge would come much easier. With a blush on his cheeks from the excitement of the prospect of magic, he is completely ready now. Upon reaching the age of two, every child has a chance to join the mage evaluation. And today's the day to determine if he has the potential for mana. His father wished him good luck for the assessment. He honorably bid farewell to his father in the arms of the beautiful Scarlet.
As the reincarnation of the Red Dragon and the descendant of a powerful mage, he is optimistic about his chances. As the carriage started its journey, he was already confident that he was guaranteed to pass the test. If he were to reclaim his draconic magic, no one would be able to stop him from returning to the top. We need him to become OP as soon as possible. After a long journey on the carriage, Ray was woken up by the cheerful voice of his mother. With a yawn and a stretch, he took in the sights of the town. If there was anything he was worried about, it would be his weak body. They walked through the central marketplace where merchants of all kinds gathered. Businessmen traded their wares while trying to maximize their profits. One wealthy-looking merchant in particular was boasting about his intermediate-quality beast crystals to an adventurer. Out of nowhere, a man approached the merchant and the adventurer to ask for something to eat. The guy snapped at the beggar as he kicked and warned him not to get in the way of his business again. Ray saw all of this transpire with his own curious eyes. He thought that this was a tragedy. Even though they were all humans, they looked down on and jeered at those who were weaker than they were. In his past life, he treated protecting the weak as his duty, no matter the shape, form, or even species, and he worked hard towards that end. Granted, it still failed in the end, leading him to his current predicament. Dragons were chill. Man, humanity is really out here with nothing but else. While being carried in his mother's arms, they finally arrive at the crowded Roland Academy. A long line of people trying their luck in the mage evaluation could be seen stretching from the entrance to outside the academy. An attendant guided them to follow the line in an orderly fashion as they would be called if their name was listed. This was the first time he had seen this many people. His excitement was reaching its peak. Meanwhile, those who took the test and failed grieved in the background. I would ace this mage assessment for real. Get me a registration form. The candidate ahead of them caused a scene as she threw a tantrum over the unfairness of the assessment because she did not pass. Seeing this scene was too familiar for Ray. This world is unfair, and it always has been. That's when an attendant called his name to undergo the mage evaluation next. They were asked to come forward, and a hint of nervousness could be seen on Scarlet's face. It was finally his turn to find out his affinity for mana. I'm betting on high affinity. The robed and bearded facilitator of the mage evaluation asked the mother and son to take a seat in front of a magical ball. He continued to instruct them to have Ray put his hands on the crystal ball. If he had the aptitude for magic, it would glow. The color of the glow would also indicate what element he had an aptitude for. Baby Ray raised his hands as his much-awaited chance had finally arrived. He could already tell that the mighty red dragon would make everyone's jaws drop. He eagerly awaited the results of his mage evaluation. In his past life, he had been versed in every type of magic in existence. After a few moments, he started to hear his mother crying behind him. He chalked this up to his mom being too shocked by his talent in magic. Or maybe she was crying because they both had the same elemental affinity, but after a few more silent moments, he started to notice that the crystal ball was not glowing at all. Oh man, he got targeted by the classic no magic main character syndrome. The bearded facilitator finally concluded the evaluation and deemed Ray a child who did not have an aptitude for magic. He found this verdict preposterous. Where had you ever seen a dragon without magical capabilities? He had been the strongest red dragon in his past life too. Scarlet tried to appeal to the facilitator to ensure that the results were final. She had graduated from this very academy, so it was hard to believe that her child had no magic talent at all. Meanwhile, Ray was aggressively smacking the crystal ball with frustration as he believed they had gotten it wrong. Bro was tapping that crystal like goes in money. He was certain that this stupid ball was broken. The facilitator took the crystal ball away as he apologized for the negative results once again. Ray couldn't just take this disrespect lying down. He was the ruler of magic, after all. He stood up and grabbed onto the facilitator's long, white beard as he tried to convince him that he knew magic. Imagine a two-year-old baby tormenting you like this. He was convinced that this old man was simply lying to him, that this guy was just trying to hide his abilities to trick them. Scarlet couldn't control her son as the facilitator was forced to call out to the guards on standby. To think that the legendary dragon would not know magic after reincarnation, this really was a twisted joke. Late in the night, the mother and son duo once again boarded the carriage on the way home. Ray wondered if this was his punishment from the heavens because he had killed too many humans in the past. If that was the case, then what was the point? If he was going to be punished, then why had they reincarnated him in the first place? That's when a thought popped into his mind. He concluded that the heavens were testing him. Bro was optimistic as hell. If he couldn't become a mage, then he must find another way to take revenge. Morning came, and the Talon family gathered at the table to share breakfast. The mood was evidently downcast as they sat and ate silently. 
Ray interjected amidst the silence, calling out to his father. He asked Jake to teach him how to fight. Jake immediately smiled upon hearing his son ask him to train in swordsmanship. He's about to become a red-haired Zoro. This was Ray's next move. He might not be able to learn magic, but he could still be a swordsman. His dream of taking revenge would come true, one way or another. With that being said, revenge was not as easy as he thought it would be. In front of him stood his confidently smiling father, while he struggled to catch his breath. Both were wielding wooden swords. He had been learning swordsmanship from his old man for two years now, and in that time, he had not won even once. Drawing his wooden sword with a serious expression, he intended to change his zero-win record today. Bro was just beating his kid up and calling training. Someone should call child services. Jake swung his sword wide with a casual smile. This was the move Ray was looking for. He knew it the best. He just needed to seize the chance and pivot at the exact moment Jake swung down. If he timed it right, he would be able to attack his father's side. He could already see it so clearly. As Jake swung down, everything went just as Ray thought it would. With his prediction, he would be able to win today. But as he was about to execute his move, he slipped on the grass. Fellas, this is why touching grass is never a good idea. Before he could even recover from the blunder, the wooden sword was already close to his face. With a wooden sound, he was knocked out cold. He questioned why it always turned out like this. His body just couldn't keep up with his brain. These clumsy limbs were truly dragging him down. Give this boy his wings back. When he woke up, Scarlet was eagerly taking care of his injuries while Jake laughed at another loss for his boy. Scarlet scolded Jake for still laughing and not holding back with their four-year-old child. He reasoned that there was only one year until the night trials. If this continued, Ray would not be able to pass. She insisted that he was still pushing the boy too hard. Their son did not need to follow in their footsteps. There were many jobs out there other than being an adventurer. That is a WU mom right there were putting him on the S-class mom tier list. With a reassuring smile, Jake claimed that he was not pushing hard at all. Ray just seemed clumsy, but that was only because he was too young and did not have enough control over his body yet. They had an entire year left. They must be united in believing that Ray could enter the Avrian Academy. Seeing this exchange, Ray questioned if he could really make it into the Knight Academy in a year. He reassured his parents not to worry about him. In his mind, he was certain that the reincarnation of a red dragon would never be as weak as a simple human. He expressed his determination to pull this off. He swore that he would be the strongest person anyone had ever seen. We believe in you, little bro. He was back on the training grounds again. He knew that he was much more capable than humans at a similar age range. But what he still lacked was control. It frustrated him that the human body was so clumsy and poorly built. They had four limbs, but they had to move everything separately. For someone accustomed to the body of a monstrous dragon, this was an extremely difficult adjustment. He swung his wooden sword countless times, and his father spotted him. Pops, you must teach him a cool finisher or something. Jake handed him a real steel sword. From now on, this would be his sword to keep. At his level, he could handle the real deal for practice now. Bro is giving his four-year-old son a deadly weapon. Father of the year right there. He was surprised at this gift that his father had handed to him. It was almost as tall as he was. Jake reassured his son that it would help him improve his control at a much faster rate. While smiling, he bent down and whispered to his son that there was also another gift waiting for him. In the storage room of their house, Jake surprised Ray with a magic puppet. It appeared to be an ordinary wooden puppet with nothing special about it. It's that one character from Tekken. Ray was taken aback by the underwhelming appearance of this gift. Jake urged him not to underestimate him. Though, this puppet was powered by magic. And the students of Avrian Knight Academy used these things to train their students. Looking at it intently, Ray still could not see what was so special about this supposed magic puppet. In his eyes, it looked just like a regular puppet. To convince him, Jake urged his son to give it a try and go for an attack. With full confidence, Ray took his wooden sword and slowly approached the puppet. As he started his offensive with a straightforward rush, the puppet started to move, activating its level 1 capability. Oh snap! As I installed. Ray was left surprised as his wide swing collided with the wooden shield of the puppet. He was briefly panicked as the puppet started to lift its own wooden sword. With a simple swing of the blade, the puppet knocked Ray's weapon right out of his hand. In just one exchange, the puppet defeated Ray and promptly terminated its level 1 operation. Bro lost to the chat GPT puppet. Jake watched with a smile from a distance as he saw his son suffer a loss from his new gift. He reassured Ray that if he could win against the first level of the puppet, it would guarantee that he would pass the exams. 
Jake had used many of his connections just to get this thing as a thoughtful gift for his son. After the initial shock of his loss, Ray's eyes sparked with excitement. He was determined to win against this puppet in no time. We see the clear blue skies and the serene colors of the trees as we hear the sound of grunts from someone swinging the sword with full determination in the outskirts of the village. Ray collapsed in frustration, his new trusty sword by his side. His movements still can't keep up with his thoughts. This human body of his is truly too weak. If this continues, he will not be able to beat the first level of the puppet, let alone take revenge against mankind. As he tries to get up from lying down, he hears an unfamiliar voice asking him why he wants to beat up a puppet. He is put on high alert as he postures himself for a counterattack while asking who is out there. What he sees is not what he was expecting at all. It is a blonde girl wearing a red hooded cloak around the same age as him. Little Red Riding Hood is out here complete with her basket and all that. She apologizes for sneaking up and startling Ray. She introduces herself as Amy. Like him, she also lives in the nearby village. She noticed that he is still out here at this late hour and just wanted to remind him to leave the mountains before the sun goes down. He sheathes his sword as he realizes that she means no harm whatsoever and was only warning him of the dangers of the mountains. She continues that it is fine to roam around here in the morning, but this place is too near the magic forest. As a result, several magic beasts appear in the area after sundown. Girl, the only magic beast you should worry about is the big bad wolf. Ray did not know that magic beasts roamed in this area at all. It seems like Amy knows a lot about this place. She knows a great deal about the mountains because she often plucks fruits and vegetables nearby. She has become familiar with this place after a while. She offers to accompany him to go down the mountain together as it is going to get dark soon. He agrees and commits her name, Amy, to his memory. Just as he is about to introduce himself, he stops in his tracks. Amy already knows that this kid's name is Ray. She mentions that he is famous in the village. This reminder causes Ray's mood to take a turn. He knows that he is famous in the village. Every time he walks with his parents, the villagers greet them with respect while whispering about the color of his hair, with every praise about just how big he has become, a whisper of the gossip that he has cursed is hidden underneath, with every invitation to come over and with every grateful remark to his mother and father, a murmur of disgust and fear from his supposed curse is veiled behind. No human has ever grown red hair in this village, so he has become a foreign entity to everyone. They respect his parents, but they have an unfounded fear toward him. Bro really had the Naruto treatment in the village. Only this time, his parents are still alive. Every whisper he hears stings his small body. Maybe it's because the adults would always use stories of vicious and terrifying red dragons to scare their children. Red is a color signifying strength as well as evil in human society. It's especially ironic considering the fact that greedy humans were the ones who raised every dragon to the ground. Now, they are still the ones being written off and painted as evil in stories. They use their boundless power and fire to take revenge and protect themselves. But humans only saw it as proof of their supposed brutality. It really do be like that, bro. Haters gonna hate even after wiping your race out. Amy notices that Ray has stopped in his tracks, so she calls out to him to hurry up. With a rustle of the trees, the two walk side by side, exiting the mountains. It turns out that Amy has been seeing him around these parts often lately. She asks him if he has been practicing. Ray confirms that he has been training to become a swordsman. Amy knows that Ray's father is the only swordsman in the village, so she inquires whether he is going to sign up for the Knight Academy. After hearing his confirmation, she shares that her brother is going to sign up for the exam as well. No one can beat her brother in the village, but he is probably jealous that Ray has his father as a mentor although normal folks do not have the chance to learn proper swordsmanship. Amy even suggests the idea of Ray and his brother becoming friends and practicing together. As they are about to step out of the mountains, they hear the sound of various footsteps approaching them. From the direction of the footsteps, a rude and overbearing shout can be heard calling out to them. This catches both Amy's and Ray's attention. It is a similarly blonde kid with his sidekicks, addressing Ray as red hair and demanding him to leave his sister alone. I'm just going to say it. This kid has a really punchable face. This type of provocation does not go over well with Ray. Amy steps in between them as he calls out his brother, Gary, for being tactless when Ray has not done anything to her. Gary questions his sister for hanging around with red hair. He warns her that Ray's curse is contagious. He even checks if his sister's hair has turned red. Meanwhile, his two cronies arrogantly approach Ray, hurling trash talks against him, calling him shameless and asking him to leave the village altogether. Why does Sadie Kicks have to be so extra all the time? The chums got right in Ray's ear and whispered stinging words. One said that his parents probably had a hard time raising a cursed child like Ray. 
The other one jokingly remarked how terrifying it is to be on the bad side of this supposed curse. He urged Ray and his family to move away as soon as possible, as the rest of the village were just common folk who couldn't get involved in that sort of thing. They continued to mock his parents for being high and mighty wizards who couldn't sympathize with lowly civilians, while Ray clenched his fist in anger. Oh no. Trash-talking the parents is in no going back zone. It's on sight with these goons. As the group walked away, he couldn't take it anymore and angrily called out to them. In just a second, his fist was already hurtling through the air, aiming for the face of the goon who was fearlessly talking trash. This guy is learning the lesson of for round and find out in real time. Gary forcefully shoved the guy to the side as he absorbed Ray's punch with his armed guard. He immediately felt a sharp pain traveling through his protective gear. He was sent flying from the impact of Ray's critical punch. He warned the blonde kid not to get in the way anymore. He just wants to beat up the one who insulted his parents. His punch was so intense that it left his fist smoldering. This little kid could probably beat all of us up, boys. Gary quickly regained his bearings as he called out to Ray seriously. He knew that both of this kid's parents were adventurers. His father was even a renowned swordsman. He reckoned that Ray was probably trained a lot, so if Ray wanted to fight, Gary happily offered himself as an opponent. He continued that he wouldn't even use a weapon because he didn't want to kill Ray. He handed his sword to his cronies as Amy tried her best to stop this ensuing fight. Bro really has a personal sword holder on his side. Ray was up to the challenge as he threw his sword away to the side. As he assumed a fighting position, he taunted Gary and his sidekicks to attack him all at once. He didn't care at all. The sound of blows being exchanged could be heard in the middle of the woods. The cheers of Gary's cronies and Amy's cries to stop echoed throughout the large field. After a few exchanges, Ray was finally hit by a solid punch to the face, knocking him back as his sack of coins flew out of his pockets in the middle of his fall. Gary promptly caught the coin sack as he urged Ray to admit defeat. Ray fell flat on the ground with dirt and bruises all around his body. Bro, he's got no hose, no coins, and his drip is full of dirt. Pray for our boy, Ray. Ray struggled to stand back up as he felt a deep sense of frustration. Gary said that he was just too weak. He continued that this kid really was disappointing. He already had his father helping him every step of the way with his training, and yet he was still useless. Meanwhile, his father was only a regular merchant. Bro pulled a reverse dad card. Gary capped off this fight by urging Ray to give up on being a swordsman and to focus on something he was good at. Ray struggled and fell once again onto the grass bed. The last words that the arrogant Gary spewed at him echoed in his head endlessly until they consumed him. Back at an ordinary house in the village, Gary and Amy finally arrived back home. Amy was quick to scold her brother for going overboard today. Go off, little Red Riding Hood. He insisted that Ray deserved it. He also demanded that his sister stay away from that red-haired kid in the future, as a lot of people are scared of that cursed hair color. He asserted that they were far too different from the Talon family, their parents were just ordinary people. In frustration, the only thing she could do was scream at her brother that she hated him. She stormed off fuming, leaving her dirtied and bruised brother to tend to himself. As Gary was taking off his protective gear, he noticed that his armed guard was bent and dented heavily. This alerted him immensely. This just meant that if he hadn't had his protective gear back then, his arm would have been broken right from the very first blow. Ray Talon would have won that fight. Just another reminder to always use protection, kids. Back at the Talon house, Ray has finally picked himself up from defeat and walked back home. His mother was cheerfully preparing dinner as she welcomed her son back home from training. Once she saw that her precious son was full of bruises and dirt all over, she immediately rushed to his side and asked if he had gotten in a fight with someone. He just shrugged his shoulders and reasoned that he had just gotten hurt during practice. Scarlet would not let this go, though. She asked if he was lying to her and if he was being bullied by the village kids. Although his mother had guessed correctly, he still denied it. She was worried that the wounds all around her son would leave scars, but he said it was alright since he was a man after all. After living for an eternity as a legendary dragon, he's still just a kid in his mom's eyes. That's another W for Mommy of the Year, Scarlet. The carefree Jake was smiling with approval as he saw his son's battle wounds. He praised Ray for working hard on his training. Right after getting home, Ray notified his parents that he was going to practice for a bit. It was almost dinner time and he was still trying to get some training. In the storage room, Ray diligently activated the magic puppet to level 1. He started his combat training with the puppet, which dashed towards him with a shield bash that he skillfully dodged to the side. He had become used to the attack patterns of the puppet. After dodging the shield, Ray raised his wooden sword as he tried to find an opening in the opponent's movements. 
However, his serious expression and determination were short-lived as his wooden sword got caught by a pillar in the storage room. Even the bot could not believe how badly you messed that up, bro. The magic puppet did not let the chance go and struck Ray at the back of his head while he was not paying attention and trying to retrieve his stuck wooden sword. The next day, we were back in the vast expanse of the beautiful greenery and bright blue sky of the mountains. Ray was walking towards his usual training spot, but there was a familiar figure standing there already. He knew all too well who this person was. It was Amy. She was looking around nervously, seemingly waiting for someone to arrive. She finally spotted Ray walking slowly towards her and blushed profusely. Her cheerful expression quickly turned into embarrassment as she remembered what her brother had done the other day. Finally, she gritted her teeth and welcomed Ray with a wide smile on her face while joyfully waving at him. It seemed like she had been waiting for him for a while now to express her apologies in person. She's a W friend for real. Ray assured her that it was fine. It was not a big deal. It was not her fault anyway. After what Gary did to him, he realized that he just was not strong enough. Amy teared up as she genuinely felt bad about what happened. Ray saw this and reaffirmed his stance that humans really are a troublesome breed. It looked like he really needed to learn how to socialize. Is he going to learn the art of Riz at such a young age? He walked closer to Amy and took a single apple from her basket. He took a bite and declared that this would do as a symbol of him accepting her apology properly. She reassured Ray that his brother Gary would not trouble him anymore. From that day onward, Amy would appear at the same place and at the same time every single day. Sometimes she would talk for an entire day while Ray swung his sword persistently, and other times they would just share the silence as she read a book quietly. Sooner rather than later, he got used to having her by his side every day. Bro is literally having the best childhood ever. At the entrance of the Talon family, a whole cavalry of armored soldiers and combat horses gathered out front. Oh man, this will either be really good or really bad. The leader of the troops stood in front of Jake and Scarlet as they received an extremely dire piece of news. Jake was shocked to learn that the nearby villages had also been attacked by that thing. It seemed that there hadn't been any clear witnesses of the attacks, but there were already victims who had been infected. Those same victims were currently too disoriented to tell anyone what had happened to them. This brought the leader of the troops to ask for Jake and Scarlet's help at the Talon House. Scarlet knew that those things in question didn't usually appear where humans do. This situation was too abnormal. She presented the idea of going with her husband on this mission. Jake reassured her not to worry. He was sure that this would just be a simple recon quest. Besides, Ray was going to take the Avrian Knight Academy's entrance exam. One of them had to stay with their son and take care of him. He comforted her, telling her not to worry too much as he would be back before she even noticed. She finally gave in and reminded Jake to just always be careful. What the hell is this thing that they're so stressed about? Back in the mountains, the colors of the setting sun painted the skies with a vibrant hue. Ray was struggling to catch his breath after training for the whole day. Despite putting in all the effort he could muster, he still couldn't quite coordinate his human body well. He looked behind him and saw something astonishing. Amy was quietly flipping through her book as the brilliance of the setting sun hit her at the perfect angle. Seeing this caused Ray's heart to beat so loudly that it almost jumped out of his chest. Ro finally caught the puppy love syndrome. Catching himself stunned like this, he smacked his cheeks just to snap out of it. With a blush of embarrassment on his face, he approached Amy to inform her that they should call it a day and head home for now. She was so engrossed in her book and the peaceful surroundings that she didn't even notice how late it had gotten. On the way home, Ray asked her if she was getting bullied in the village for hanging out with him. With all the rumors that he was cursed with his red hair, he worried that Amy might be getting dragged into it as well. She was resolute in her belief that it was just their problem and not theirs. She did not find Ray's red hair scary at all. On the contrary, she thought it looked cool. And other than his red hair, she saw that he was a very special person deep inside. With her signature bright smile, she urged Ray to just be himself. That is a W friend and a best girl in the making right there. Hearing this sentiment from Amy reminded him of Gary's malicious words to find something he was good at. A smile began to form on his mouth as he felt something click. He couldn't believe that he hadn't thought of it sooner. He excitedly thanked her for clearing his mind. He eagerly ran back home as the two bade farewell, looking forward to their usual meeting the next day. In the middle of the night, back in the Talon House's storage room, the magic puppet promptly activated to its first level. Ray slowly brought the wooden sword to his mouth. Zora would be super proud. He bit down the handle firmly as he crouched down on all fours. To do what he was truly good at, he would be unleashing his true self. The magic puppet started its operation as it scanned Ray and initiated the trial. 
With nimble and natural movements, he jumped and moved like a wild beast on all fours, running circles around the magic puppet. He confirmed that he was much more agile when he moved with all his limbs activated. Now was time to try this thing out for real. The magic puppet swung its wooden sword down, and he jumped high above, utilizing all the strength of his limbs. With a decisive smack, he landed behind the magic puppet in the blink of an eye. He finally got the literal dog in him. The power in his eyes started to fade. It slowly lowered its weapon. With its robotic voice, it informed Ray that he had passed level one. Ray was super pumped as he celebrated this win. His wild idea of going back to his previous life's fighting style had paid off. His father had said that he would be able to pass the Knight Academy exam once he beat the first level of the puppet. He had already done that just now, but he still wanted to test his limits. With a confident smile, he activated the Magic Puppet's level 2 trial. Getting greedy right after finishing the tutorial round, he's just like us. As the sun rose, the Talon household bustled with Jake's preparations. It was so early that Ray had just woken up from his sleep when he caught sight of his father, fully armored and getting ready. Jake apologized to his son as he had a quest to attend to. He was going to need to leave home for a bit, but he reassured Ray that he would be back by the time of the night academy exam. Oh man, I don't like how this departure is going. He urged his son to practice with the puppet as much as he could while he was away, encouraging him with his signature carefree and brilliant smile. He believed that his boy could beat the magic puppet. Before Ray could even brag to his father that he had already beaten the level 1 trial, the driver of the carriage called out to Jake to depart immediately. He promptly confirmed and boarded, while Scarlet reminded him to take care of himself for the nth time. As she handed her husband's long sword, the lovey-dovey couple had to go their separate ways for a while. Ray simply smiled, knowing that everything would be all right. In his mind, it was no big deal that he had defeated the puppet. He planned to shock his old man when he returned home. My spider sense is tingling, bros. What will happen to happy-go-lucky Jake? Casually walking to his training site on the mountain, he wondered how his father would react when he saw how strong he had become. It would be interesting. He gave all the credit for his breakthrough to the tip from Amy. He had found a way to solve the issue that had been plaguing him. Bagstar. As he mulled over his thoughts, he found himself growing excited and feeling genuine gratitude. He felt like he was becoming more and more human as time went on. Bro was a literal child having an existential and identity crisis. He was still convinced that humans were terrible, but his father, Jake, his mother, Scarlet, and his dear friend, Amy, these three were the rare exceptions. He leisurely strolled through the woods, vowing not to seek revenge on them when the time came. He really has the whole mankind on his kill list except those that have been a decent human being to him. At his usual training spot, he was once again out of breath after a whole day of sharpening his swordsmanship. It had already been a while, and it seemed like Amy wouldn't be coming today. Ray caught himself thinking about her and feeling expectant, becoming embarrassed even though nobody was around. Caught himself in 4K. With an awkward laugh, he tried to convince himself that it was for the better. Now, no one could disturb his training. Time was of the essence when it came to his training. He couldn't afford to let himself be corroded by his human emotions any longer, as he was the mighty red dragon, after all. A few hours passed and the sun began to set. Ray was laying down snoring and napping heavily after an exhausting day of non-stop sword practice. Not going to lie, that grass looks comfortable as hell. He opened his eyes at the sight of the warmly tinted sky. Seeing the sun setting above him sent the boy into a panicked state. It was already so late, and he was going to get nagged by his mom if he did not get home soon. As he hurriedly ran back home, he thought about Amy once again. He had not thanked her properly yet for the advice she gave him. She was probably just occupied today so he did not see the harm in just thanking her tomorrow. He got back to the village without a hitch, but the sky had already become dark. He spotted the villagers gathering around frantically, as it seemed like they were looking for something or someone. Oh snap, villagers with torches in their hands is not a good sign at all. Gary and Amy's father could be seen with distraught eyes as he desperately asked the village blacksmith if he had seen his children. The blacksmith confirmed that he had seen four children come to buy new weapons in his shop earlier that morning. He also heard the blonde-haired boy tell the others that they were going to the forest to hunt magic beasts or something along those lines. This statement drained the life out of Amy and Gary's parents. Hearing that their children had gone to hunt magic beasts was a punch in the gut. The other villagers criticized the village blacksmith for not stopping the children. How could an adult let young kids go to the forest by themselves? The blacksmith insisted that he did not know the children were really going to go. This guy did not even ask for an ID or something. He's really out here selling deadly weapons to toddlers. 
Amy and Gary's father took action because it was far too dangerous in the forest at night. They had to call the guards and tell them to join the search for the kids. Ray listened to all the commotion as he walked past the panicking villagers casually. All he thought about was that with Gary's little party missing. It seemed like karma was working extremely fast. He thought those kids got what was coming to them. If they were to be killed by magic beasts, it would be less of a chore for him. But Amy, she was missing too. She treated him decently, and he did not want to include her in his revenge against humanity. But she had that foolish brother of hers. As the villagers lit up their torches and organized the search, Ray walked past them. In his mind, human lifespans were short after all, so it was really just a matter of time. He took a few more steps, trying to convince himself that this was his stance, but when the lively face of Amy appeared in his mind, calling out to him, he stopped in his tracks. He realized that he had his own path to walk on. After deliberating even more while standing still, he felt a feeling that he had not felt before. Lil Bro was starting to develop empathy, good for him. He swiftly turned around with urgency on his face. He stopped deluding himself that he was above this. This wouldn't do. Amy was innocent. He rushed toward the direction of the forest, hoping that Amy could hold out and wait for him to arrive. He was determined to find her. He still hadn't thanked her for helping him defeat the puppet yet. Deep in a forest, a few bodies of wolf beasts could be seen littering the ground. Alongside those wolves were Gary's two sidekicks lying unconscious. Gary himself stood resolutely with a sword in his hands as he tried to shield Amy from something facing the siblings. She cried in fear as her brother tried his best to steal his resolve. With shaky hands gripping the sword's hilt, dread could be seen on the young boy's face. They were facing a monstrous, battle-scarred, magical wolf beast with three eyes. It was at this moment, he knew. He effed up. Ray ran as fast as he possibly could. He huffed and puffed as he struggled to catch his breath, desperate in his rush. As he delved deep into the forest, he began to smell the scent of fresh blood nearby. This put him on high alert, increasing the likelihood that Amy was in danger. Upon arriving at the scene and leaning against a tree for support, he was disappointed to discover that the source of the smell was just a young demonic wolf. Did those little rascals kill a young puppy? There appeared to be an incision from a blade on its stomach, and it was still warm. Judging from the signs of struggle, the party was nearby. However, there was one glaring problem. The footsteps on the ground were all mixed up. Ray couldn't figure out which way to go from there. While he was grappling with his next move, he heard a loud scream from a familiar voice. It was undoubtedly Amy's. Yeri took on the massive demonic wolf, and the outcome was as expected. He was sent flying toward the trees, screaming in pain from his injuries. Lil bro is getting clapped, we love to see it. Keep Amy safe, though. Amy rushed her brother's side, her expression flustered, as the demonic wolf loomed over them, slowly advancing. Is this the alternate ending for the little red riding hood? With a sudden leap, the demonic wolf opened its jaws, emitting a savage howl as it pounced on the scene aiming to devour the children whole. Helpless, Amy closed her eyes. Knowing she couldn't do anything about the demonic wolf that was about to make them its dinner, she called out to someone, anyone, to help them. As copious amounts of blood spurted onto the ground, a sharp glint of a blade became visible as Amy anxiously opened her eyes. It was none other than Ray, wielding his sword and thwarting the demonic wolf's attack by jamming his blade through the beast's mouth. Now, that's how you make an entrance, Demonic Wolf Slayer Riz. Ray asked if Amy was all right, and she confirmed that she was, but the other kids were in bad condition. Before she could finish her thought, the wolf was already launching a follow-up attack. Ray was too slow to react, and the monster scratched him on the shoulder. He stumbled backward, losing his balance. Catching himself with his hands, he stabilized on the ground and faced the demonic wolf. He reassured Amy not to worry, as he wouldn't die so easily. He formulated a plan to lure the monstrous wolf away from her first. As it made another savage scratch, Ray responded adeptly by jumping onto a tree branch. The demonic wolf quickly adjusted its position, locking onto Ray. With a high jump, it lunged upward, but Ray swiftly evaded the attack with expert precision. He had been barely dodging throughout the entire fight with a beast. He grew extremely frustrated with his own body. It was too weak at this point in time. He couldn't possibly hold up against an adult demonic wolf for much longer. Bro just got nerfed too hard. In the face of absolute power, Ray's outstanding speed is just a joke. He can't even lead him away at all. In the past, a demonic wolf like this one would have been nothing in his eyes. But now, he was almost at his last stand as he tried to shield Amy. The demonic wolf was foaming at the mouth at the sight of its potential dinner. Ray called out that these humans are his and this beast is not allowed to touch them. 
The demonic wolf did not take this well at all. With a savage roar, it rushed and executed another jump with its jaws open for the bite. Ray has been anticipating this exact move. He would not be able to hold on much longer, so this next attack of his must count. He met the monstrous charge of the demonic wolf with one of his own. He already knows the weakness of this demonic wolf. Under the bloody moonlight, Ray wielded his sword between his teeth and effectively climbed up on the wolf's snout. He swung his blade and took out one of the three eyes of the beast, Rose looking like he's straight out of Demon Slayer of that slash. As soon as it felt the pain of the slash, it quickly shook him off and sent him crashing towards the ground. It is such a shame that he could only wound one of its eyes. Full of bloody injuries, Ray still managed to stand up and shield Amy behind him. If it was him in the past, he would have been able to tear this demonic wolf apart with a single casual blow. Now, he must rely on a human weapon to contend. With one eye less from the start of the battle, the demonic wolf charged once again as if it had never learned its lesson. Ray was quick to spot the opening in this big move. With the sword back in his hands, he intends to see which one of them is truly tougher. He took advantage of the small window of opportunity and took out a leg with a sharp swing of his trusty blade. This wolf has that cartoon meat. It was good that this move worked effectively, but the wolf landed all the way where the siblings were located. Amy and Gary flew from the impact of the beast's body landing. As he tried to call out if Amy was all right, the wolf desperately tried to reach him with its sharp claws. It landed squarely on his body, lacerating his skin. He tried to recover from that critical strike as he coughed up blood. This fight has been nothing but frustrations on his side. With the sword back in his teeth, Ray wants to end this fight right there and then. He wants to make this monster submit to him. He resembled a spinning tornado as he sliced and diced through the air against the wolf's massive body. That's a sick finisher. Roe is spinning like a Beyblade and dicing that big bad wolf. The demonic wolf was wounded so heavily that blood immediately drained from multiple parts of its gargantuan body. Ray had used everything in his power and stamina to execute that one final deadly move. He stumbled through the air, resembling a lifeless doll. The demonic wolf and Ray hit the ground at the same time. He has finally done it. He surveyed the surroundings and found that Amy and her brother are fine despite being knocked unconscious. In the corner of his eyes, he noticed something peculiar. An unfamiliar alert and a small burning fire started to appear out of thin air. It took the shape of a cute little draconic creature made purely of flames. Ray had no idea what's happening at all. The adorable little draconic creature sounded the alarm as it held up a sign indicating that he had received a reward. It says that he had unlocked the initial stages of the Blessing of the Dragon's Eye and obtained an intermediate grade beast crystal. Though gang, we're finally getting a glimpse of the dragon system. That's hype. He was prompted whether to absorb the beast crystal or not. The little draconic creature kept flying in front of him, letting out adorable sounds. Bro got a Pokemon package with his system. Seeing the prompt in front of him, he dismissed it as a bunch of useless information. Putting that aside, he tried to look for Amy and her brother. He had to save them, or else the blood would attract even more magic beasts. Ray tried his hardest to stand up as his wounds continued to drip blood. For a brief moment, Gary regained consciousness as Ray carried him. He recognized the kid he had beaten up a while ago, who had just saved them from certain death. That's right, boy. You owe this red-haired kid your life now. Ray told him not to move as Gary firmly held onto him. Bringing two people with him was his absolute limit at the moment. The brother and sister had passed out while Ray persisted through his severe injuries. He was getting weaker by the second. Bro was straight up doing the hacksaw ridge. As for the other two kids lying unconscious in the distance, he did his best to cover them up with loose twigs and rocks to protect them from detection by other beasts. He had already done all that he could with what he had. The rest was out of his control. Not far from the depths of the forest, the villagers gathered in their search party. They were starting to get agitated as not a single one of them had found a clue regarding the location of the missing children. Out of the thick and massive forest, they began to spot something emerging. Their eyes lit up as soon as they recognized that it was the missing children. They saw the red-haired kid from the Talon family, bloodied and beaten, carrying the blonde siblings. They immediately tried to notify the parents to come to this location. Ray asked the adults to please help the kids as they would need some healing before finally collapsing on the floor due to his grievous injuries. The villagers quickly talked amongst themselves after seeing the Talon kid come out of the forest with two kids in tow. That forest was filled with magic beasts at night, and they couldn't comprehend why these kids would willingly go inside. A lady rushed through the crowd screaming at people to get out of her way. It seemed like she was the mother of the other two missing kids, Bob and Kale. She got that lunch lady vibe going on. She was greeted with the news that only the two blonde siblings had made it out of the magic forest. 
She couldn't accept this piece of information at all. She tried to run into the forest, but the crowd of villagers stopped her, telling her she couldn't go in there by herself. She forced her way through and called the other villagers cowards for not even trying to find her sons. She ran across the bridge, believing her boys were waiting for her rescue. As she cried and ran anxiously, calling out to her kids, she felt the stare of the magical beasts lurking in the darkness of the forest. After sensing the heavy presence of a beast with three eyes, the lady finally turned tail and ran as fast as she could away from the forest. She was humiliated in front of the crowd, too scared to go after her own children. This lady will really leave his sons in the forest because she's too scared. After being humiliated by her own coward thieves, the lady turned her attention towards the tired and injured Ray. She grabbed him by his collar and aggressively interrogated him about the location of Bob and Kyle. Oh no, bro. Someone must call the cops on this lady. She insisted that her boys were both good kids, so it did not make sense for them to go into the forest. She tried to force him to talk and confess that he was the one who tricked them into going inside. The kid with a different hair color must have done it. That was the conclusion she arrived at. She slapped Ray with her heavy hand while saying that she knew that red hair was a bad sign. She was convinced that he was a sign of calamity that only brought misfortune. This lady needs to get hit. Equal rights. Equal fights. Hearing this, the other villagers also started to think the same way as they whispered amongst themselves. They were starting to unite around the idea that Ray was the one who tricked those kids into going inside the dangerous forest. They based this ridiculous notion on the fact that he was the only one who got out awake. The villagers quickly formed a mob against Ray. They poured all the blame on him without remorse. The lady even repeatedly slapped him heavily while asking why he only brought Gary and Amy back. She looked deranged as she beat up a heavily injured child. If Jake and Scarlet see this, the whole village is done for. Through all the pain he was currently suffering, Ray could not help but let out a knowing smile. He had already told everyone that the kids were still in the forest. She looked at him with utmost contempt as she reasoned that those were just children, and Ray dared to leave them in the depths of the forest to die. Hearing this sounded unreasonable to him. Had these people forgotten that he was a child too? The lady threw him away as she accused him of being a cold-blooded monster. She swore that she could not forgive Ray no matter what. Meanwhile, the other villagers were also too scared to go into the forest to rescue the remaining children. In Ray's thoughts, it seemed like these people had forgotten that he was a human too just because of his red hair. They didn't think that he was a child. They thought that he was a monster. The lady forcefully took a torch from the mob. She slowly walked towards Ray while menacingly holding the torch and repeating that she would never forgive him. She better not be trying to do what I think she's about to do. This lady needs to be locked up in the finest mental institution there is. From where Ray was standing, these people were much more terrifying than any beast could ever be. These guys were the true monsters. The lady lifted the burning torch as she cursed Ray, the red-haired monster, to die. He was way too familiar with this feeling. It seemed like he was going to die by the cruel hands of humanity once again. He looked directly at the fire with a smile as he contemplated just how humiliating it was to die by a torch. He was ready to accept his fate for the second time around. As the torch landed, it made a familiar metallic sound. It was Gary, with his trusty armed guard shielding the injured Ray. Oh snap! Gary with the clutch character development. The villagers saw this and interpreted it as Gary being charmed by the red-haired monster to do his bidding. They convinced themselves that Gary had gone mad. He glared at every adult villager around with ridicule in his eyes. He berated everyone present, saying that they were the ones who had gone mad. How could they kill someone based on a baseless assumption? He would not let these people touch his savior. How messed up are the adults in this village that the kids have a better common sense than them? The hateful stare of the lady who kept blaming him and cursing him to die was etched into Ray's memories. It gradually fused with his final memory in his past life, the Star of Calamity spell that ended his life and the mighty warriors who wanted him dead. Every single human that wanted him gone. Ray opened his eyes in a cold sweat at the tail end of such a horrifyingly real nightmare. His injuries were beginning to heal as his wounds were properly dressed and taken care of. His mother held his hand the whole time he was asleep and recovering. She even got so tired that she ended up sleeping beside him, kneeling in discomfort. It seemed like he was not the only one dreaming in the room. Scarlet gripped his hands tightly as she kept calling out to her son while in deep sleep. She cried in her slumber as tears kept pouring down her cheeks. Ray sat up and looked at his mother. The sight made him think of a complex question. How can humans be so beautiful? It's so cruel. Bro got beaten and slapped so bad, then dropped the most existential question out of nowhere. He held his mom's hand as she drooled in her sleep, slowly waking up. She immediately got up in elation as she saw her boy awake. She even thought she was still dreaming. She hugged her son tightly, 
forgetting that he was still recovering from heavy injuries. She was just too excited to see Ray waking up after sustaining serious damages. Scarlet saw it as a good sign that he was still capable of feeling pain. It served him right for acting so rashly. Ray had no idea how long he had been out of commission. It seemed like he was in deep recovery for an entire week. Scarlet started sobbing once more as she truly would not know how she would explain to Jake what happened if their son did not wake up. He also asked what happened to those people, the villagers who ganged up on him after undergoing a life and death battle. It seemed like the two kids he saved, Gary and Amy, were doing fine and only lightly wounded. But Bob and Kale were still missing in the forest. It was likely that those two had met an unfortunate fate. Going back to that night, Gary went above and beyond in shielding the unconscious Ray from the mob of delusional villagers, especially the insane lady. He repeatedly told them that they had gone into the forest by themselves, and Ray saved them in the end. The adults refused to believe Gary, convinced that he was under the malevolent influence of the red-haired monster, an allegation he also repeatedly denied. Amidst all this chaos, Scarlet made a mad dash toward the gathering of the villagers. She finally caught a glimpse of Ray being surrounded by an angry mob of villagers with ill intentions painted on their faces. Taking a closer look at the situation, the calm and gentle mage started emanating her magical powers outwardly. Oh dang, are we about to see Mrs. Talon go sicko mode on these villagers? She coldly asked the people on the scene who the hell had done this to her son. As if they had truly gone crazy, the villagers had the gall to urge Scarlet to calm down. They told her that her unconscious child lying on the ground was the one who led all the other kids into the forest, so naturally, this kid should take responsibility for his supposed actions. Gary was the only person thinking with a clear head in a place surrounded by adults. The crowd even tried to convince Scarlet that she was a mother as well, so she should know how it feels. The lady who beat up Ray tried to interject, but Scarlet's raging magical aura was too oppressive for normal people. She took her boy in her arms and gave a piercing glare directed at the crazy lady making her cry and tremble. The heartless woman had finally reached her breaking point. At that moment, nothing else mattered to her. Abandoning the torch she held, she pleaded for help from anyone who could rescue Bob and Kale. The villagers gathered around the emotional lady, their gazes filled with scorn as they directed their anger towards Scarlet and Ray. While they pitied the weeping woman, they resorted to trash-talking the young child, believing him to be cursed. Mob mentality is a hell of a drug. Though Scarlet could clearly hear their spiteful words, they paid no attention to her presence or her feelings. Meanwhile, inside the Talon household, the Carey mother comforted Ray, assuring him that everything would be alright and that it was all in the past. She didn't want her son to blame himself for the events that had transpired. Gary, who had witnessed everything firsthand, shared a detailed account of the true events with her. Filled with admiration, she commended her boy for his remarkable handling of the situation in the forest. Having been out of action for an entire week, Scarlet was eager to bring her famished son something to eat. As she closed the door to the room, Ray finally caught his breath and collected his thoughts. Raising his gaze, he couldn't help but wonder about the mysterious creature that stood before him. It was an adorable draconic being, once again appearing with a magical prompt in its grasp. Ray pondered whether everyone possessed such creatures. The icon of the blessing of the dragon's eye caught his attention, compelling him to click on it. As he interacted with the icon, the room was engulfed in a fiery surge of energy, swiftly converging upon him. Eventually, the energy settled in one of his eyes, transforming it into something far from human. So if we're starting with some dope eyes, I see you. With this altered eye, Ray gained the ability to see through the walls of the room, directly witnessing his mother busily preparing food for him in the kitchen. The system evaluated her condition, determining her to be fatigued, with her bodily functions running low. It issued a warning that she needed to rest soon. Man, she really is a contender for Mom of the Year. Ray was taken aback, as this was an ability he had possessed in the past. During his time as the Red Dragon, he had wielded a myriad of magical powers, making him a true legend. After failing the Mage Aptitude Test, he had believed he would never again have the opportunity to employ such abilities. However, to his astonishment, here it was manifesting once more. Tears welled up in his eyes as he felt a profound sense of relief. This revelation was monumental yet it appeared he could only access one ability at a time. Additionally, the mysterious prompt held another revelation, a depiction of an intermediate-grade beast crystal. Ray surmised that he had obtained it after vanquishing the intermediate-grade demonic wolf. Suddenly, he felt and smelled that something was terribly amiss. Thick black smoke permeated the air, accompanied by the harsh scent of burning. Oh no, bro. Someone is vaping nearby. It seemed that a fire was raging in parts of their house, 
Despite her fatigue, Scarlet rushed through Ray's room, determined to get him out of harm's way and away from the engulfing flames. As the inferno encroached upon their sanctuary, she shielded her son, conjuring a water spell to douse the blaze. Mom with the clutch waterbending save. Ray activated his blessing of the dragon's eye, peering through the window, fixating his gaze on the source of the fire. His eyes locked onto a familiar figure amidst the crowd of villagers. The system swiftly identified the person as carrying a flammable object, classifying her threat level as zero. It was her, the deranged woman, Bob, and Kale's unhinged mother. This lady really tried to burn the house of a fire dragon and a water mage. Outside the Talon family house, a group of villagers had gathered, their voices intertwining in a cacophony of idle chatter. They stood there, their arms crossed lazily, casting accusatory glances toward the burning structure. If you strained your ears, you could discern the whispers that brazenly assigned blame for the fire to the supposed cursed child, as if he were a malevolent force behind the flames. These neighbors are obnoxious, bro. Y'all have to move somewhere else. Emerging from the inferno, Scarlet and Ray stepped onto the scene, their faces etched with determination. Scarlet, still adorned in her apron, focused intently, delving into the depths of her mind as she prepared a potent spell. With a graceful gesture, she directed her magic toward the steadily consuming blaze. The incantation left her lips, accompanied by a resounding boom. Miraculously, the once raging fire dissipated, as if it had never possessed an ounce of existence. Wiping the sweat from her forehead, Scarlet turned her attention to the villagers encircling them. Their malicious whispers persisted, refusing to be silenced. They adamantly clung to the notion that this fire, too, was a consequence of the curse. In their minds, if Ray remained in their midst, the entire village would be doomed to ruins. Undeterred by the whispers, Scarlet mustered a brave expression and moved towards her son, ensuring his well-being and soothing any fears that may have gripped him. But Ray, lost in his thoughts, wore a distant gaze. Reverting to his childlike nature, he reassured his mother that he was unharmed. He commended her for her swift action in extinguishing the fire, marveling at her composure amidst the chaos. Hand in hand, they returned to the shelter of their home. As they strolled, Ray once again succumbed to contemplation, his mind absorbed in weighty matters. He was acutely aware of the villagers' desires to witness their home reduced to cinders and to see both him and his mother perish in the flames. With an inferno of hatred and vengeance smoldering within his young eyes, Ray resolved to stop playing nice. These people sought their demise, and he would not play the role of the obedient victim any longer. Revenge was his sole objective, and time was of the essence. Number one on the death note should be the crazy lady. The following morning arrived, and it seemed as though the tragedy of the previous day had been erased from existence. The Talon house stood unscathed, displaying no remnants of the devastating fire. Meanwhile, Ray, returning to his routine, informed his mother that he would be heading out to train. Scarlet, in her motherly nature, advised caution and urged him not to overexert himself, mindful of his incomplete recovery. Ray stood at the familiar bridge where the fateful events had unfolded. Clutching his trusty sword and carrying two wooden buckets, he faced the entrance to the magic forest. Drawing his blade, he activated his dragon's eye, and fiery magic converged, granting him the sight of a dragon. Surveying the fringes of the mystical woodland, he could already discern numerous creatures lurking amidst the foliage. But this proved advantageous, only beginner magical beasts inhabited this region, posing no threat he couldn't handle. In the heart of the day, beneath the comforting shade of towering trees, a fledgling magical creature reached out for a ripe, luscious fruit, relishing its succulent flavors in tranquility and serenity. Behind the unsuspecting beginner-level magical beast lurks a silent blade, patiently awaiting the perfect moment to strike and spill its blood. Ray swiftly thrusted his sword into the body of the magical beast, employing the dragon's eye to effortlessly hunt and refine his skills. Bro just wanted to munch on some apples and Ray came in to ruin the vibes. As Ray gracefully descended to the ground, the lifeless body of the beast tumbled down from the towering trees. Surveying the scene below, it became evident that he had been tirelessly engaged in his work throughout the day, evident from the numerous magical beast corpses strewn across the ground, all hunted down by his expert blade. Is he on an MMORPG quest or something? Why is he grinding down everything in the beginner area? Gazing upon his impressive hall, he determined that the twenty casually hunted beasts would suffice for his purpose in visiting the forest. Out of nowhere, an adorable draconic creature materialized, alerting him to the acquisition of a beginner-grade beast crystal, prompting him to consider whether to absorb it. Surprisingly, he discovered he had obtained another one. 
As he observed the number of beast crystals in his possession, he concluded that acquiring them was entirely a matter of luck. Despite slaying 20 beginner magical beasts, he had only managed to secure two crystals. What remained unknown to him was the consequence of absorbing them as indicated by the notification. From the corner of his eye, he noticed the lone beast, a demonic wolf puppy, quietly sobbing. Emerging from the woods, it approached the remains of an adult demonic wolf that Ray had hunted down. Witnessing this sight, a conflicted expression crossed his face. Is that a hint of character development we are seeing? He approached the small pup with caution and informed it that it would now have to fend for itself. As he extended his hand to pet the creature, the pup instinctively evaded his touch and growled in response. Suddenly, the system notified him of a taming opportunity. He was prompted to decide whether to feed the black demon wolf pup a beast crystal or not. This notion of taming was entirely foreign to him. Hell yeah, we're getting a Pokemon system. Unaware of the consequences, he decided to give it a try. Opting for the yes option, the system initiated the taming process. A dark energy enveloped both the beast crystal and the black demon wolf pup, as the energy fused the crystal with the pup. A notification confirmed the successful taming of the black demon wolf pup. Ray celebrated the triumph of taming the beast, but to his surprise, the pup swiftly transformed into a stream of energy and entered his head, disappearing. He was caught off guard by the sudden assimilation of the creature into his own body after the taming process. Bro, his head is the Pokeball itself. Curious about potential side effects and the ability to summon the creature externally, he sought answers from the little draconic creature. It nodded its tiny head, assuring him that there were no adverse effects, and he could summon it at will. He vowed that if this did not prove true, he would dispose of the adorable creature as well. Another system alert materialized before him, notifying him that he had unlocked the second ability out of a thousand in the system, thanks to the successful taming. It was a pleasant surprise to gain an ability through this interaction. However, there was no time for further delay. Ray had pressing matters to attend to. With his dragon's eye activated, he wondered if they were nearby. Carefully scouring and scanning the forest in the darkness of the night, he finally discovered what he had been seeking. Two figures concealed within a mountainous area came into view. Upon closer inspection, the two figures that the dragon's eye had identified appeared familiar to him. With a malevolent gleam in his eyes, he had finally found what he had been searching for. Oh no, is he about to do the most messed up prank possible known to man? As Ray slowly walked into a dark cavern, skulls and skeletons of different shapes and sizes could be seen littering the ground. He followed his dragon's eye and finally found the remains of the siblings, Bob and Kale. In just a week, the flesh, blood, and organs of the two had already been feasted upon by the beasts in the magic forest and the dark cavern. It looks like the magic beasts just had a feast. He coldly looked at the skeleton as he carefully took off their tattered clothes. After placing the clothes that the two wore on their final day into one of the buckets, he noticed that the other one had been filled to the brim with a crimson red substance. Is he making spaghetti or something? Leaving the remains of Bob and Kale, Ray walked out of the dark cavern, never looking back. It was the dead of the night, and we were back in the Talon house. Ray was gently scolded by his mom for staying out so late and pushing himself even though he hadn't fully recovered yet. He responded as any other kid would. Starla was worried that her son was becoming a little bit more rebellious today. He had even gotten his clothes dirty as well. With a disinterested yawn, Ray stated that he still had a practice tomorrow, so he would get some sleep now. She was starting to stress out about the challenges of raising Ray. She informed him that Jake was coming back in just a couple of days, so they would be able to train together then. Ray got up in genuine excitement, kicking off the blanket in enthusiasm. He couldn't wait to show his pops the results of his tireless training. Look at this legendary dragon being so excited to show his dad that he can kick butt now. Seeing her son messing up the bed, Scarlet went into monster mom mode as she roared at her rebellious son to put his blanket on properly. Maybe it was because of the instinctual fear from his current human bloodline, but the mighty Ray obediently lay down on the bed as per his mom's orders. As the night grew deeper and the village became shrouded in silence, we returned to Ray's room at the Talon household. At first, he appeared to be just a simple boy sleeping, but he had been waiting for this moment all day. He opened his eyes with a serious expression and a solid determination. Bro is a man on a mission. He sneaked out of the house and into the storage room where he kept his things. The door menacingly creaked open as he spotted the buckets he had covered up before coming home. With the buckets in his hands, he quietly set out on his mission on this starry night. We arrive at Bob and Kale's house, where their insane mother resides. In the midst of the silence, a persistent sound of something or someone moving and thumping around could be faintly heard. 
He's going full on horror movie on this lady. With a lantern in her hand, the lady got up from her sleep and slowly ventured outside her room to see what was happening and who was outside. With her signature angry voice, she called out to the person outside to stop knocking at such a late hour. Despite her firm call out, the thumping and knocking sound did not stop at all. The broken woman, grasping at straws, wondered if these were her sons, Bob and Kale, finally coming home. She was extremely hopeful as she opened the door to call out for her sons, asking the empty air if they had come back. What greeted her on the outside was the dead silence of the night and a familiar tattered piece of clothing in her yard. Examining it closely, she confirmed that these were undoubtedly Kale's clothes. She fell to her knees as she shivered at the sight of a clue to her boy's whereabouts. Ray's out here playing mind games against his enemies. I respect that. With renewed hope in her voice, she called out loudly to ask if Kale was really nearby. In front of her was a visible trail of footsteps the size of a child's shoe. Seeing this raised her hopes even more. Ray is devious for this stunt, man. Picking up the lantern once again, she ran and followed the footsteps on the ground as she screamed for Bob and Kale. She was coming to them, so they had to wait for her. The night was dark, and the only thing illuminating the magic forest was the bright light of the moon in the sky. Deep in the woods, the crazy lady finally arrived at the bridge leading into the outskirts of the magic forest. As she caught her breath, she started to notice that this place was too dark, even with a lantern in her hands. She knew she should not go any further as it would not be safe at all. Behind her, a familiar red-haired figure surveyed everything from a perch on a tree. With the sudden sound of something falling from high up, the lady felt a shiver down her spine as she quickly turned around to see where the noise came from. Shedding light on an area beyond the bridge, she saw the tattered clothes of her other son. Bob draped over a tree branch and swaying in the wind. Someone should get this kid a prank show on TV. Ray quietly observed everything according to his plans while his dragon's eye was active. Countless small but savage magic beasts lurked beneath the darkness of the magic forest. The lady couldn't help but rush deep into the danger zone as soon as she saw Bob's clothes. She pleaded for her sons to stop running away from her and come home. While the lady screamed at the top of her lungs, desperate for any signs of her boys, Ray patiently observed while holding a rope tied to the bucket of crimson substance directly above his target. With a snap, he finally let go of the rope as the lady stepped into where he wanted her to be. The rope was knocked loose, and a crimson substance inside the bucket was unleashed onto the unsuspecting victim. The lady was splattered and covered by the crimson substance. This would be my least favorite type of shower. In a panic, she tried to look around to find who in the world had done this to her. To answer the question in her mind, Ray promptly jumped down from his hiding spot and finally faced the lady who had been nothing but a problem to him. Reverting to her contemptuous attitude, she pointed at Ray as if this was confirmation of all the rumors that they had propagated against him. With his inhuman dragon's eye activated, she berated him for being a bringer of misfortune after all. She demanded that he bring her children back. She had lost all reason as she started to charge forward of all her might while covered with a crimson substance that Ray had specially prepared. But before she could even take another step, she was halted in place by the sight behind the red-haired boy. Hungry eyes of countless magic beasts lurking in the foliage and trees looked at her as if she were the perfect midnight snack. Bro has that dog in him, and he got dogs outside too. From the front and the back, countless magical beasts surrounded her after being doused by the crimson substance that Ray had prepared. This crimson substance was the blood of the 20 beginner magic beasts that Ray had hunted down earlier. It was extremely effective at luring other monsters out. As the lady panicked, Ray slowly stepped back to let the feast happen. He did not take his eyes off her as he watched the lady who had tried to kill him multiple times and even had the audacity to include his mom in her attempts to end him get torn into bits by a legion of magic beasts. With a visceral scream, her blood spurted out onto the cold, hard ground under the bright light of the full moon. She kept on looking for her sons. She will finally meet them again. Ray is good at reuniting families. The sun has risen on the village once again as a new day begins. The villagers are back at it again with their whispering and gossiping as usual. But this time, they have a more serious tone than they usually do. It seems like the news has finally hit everyone, making them believe that the curse is real after all. They have transitioned from being scornful to being genuinely afraid of getting on the bad side of the Talon family after the grisly news of the demise of the irrational lady has become public. Speaking of the Talon family and curses, the villagers spotted Ray walking close to them, and the fear in their eyes is blatant. He just stared at them with blank eyes, and it was enough. The villagers greeted him good morning and praised him for being so hardworking and training again at such an early hour. Haters turn around as soon as they see you going up. And by going up, I mean murdering the crazy lady of the village. He walked away from the bumbling crowd as they heaved a sigh of relief. 
Ray finally noticed that there seemed to be new rumors floating around now. With a faint smile, he thinks that this new status quo is not too bad. He really likes it. He walked back home to the Talon household. And what greeted him was several combat horses that looked extremely tired and defeated. Seeing the sight of these cavalry horses caught his attention. He didn't even notice the expression of the animals as this commotion in front of their house could only mean one thing. With his trusty sword in tow, he excitedly opened the door with a big smile on his face, asking if his father is home already. What he saw inside their house was an extremely heavy and downcast air of defeat and sadness. The armored soldiers looked tired and crushed, while his mother was kneeling beside the bed, sobbing uncontrollably. This does not look like a coming back party at all. From the moment he laid eyes on what was happening inside, he could already tell that something seriously bad had happened. Moving past and shoving the armored troops to the side, he ran forward as fast as he could to ask his mother what was wrong and what was going on. With her shaky voice, she informed her son that his dad is severely sick. Ray finally got closer and saw his lively, carefree, and always brightly smiling father emaciated, convulsing heavily. He was painted with the colors of death and decay all over his body. This is how I normally look like after reading manuals without a wink of sleep. Starlet trembled and sobbed as she urged Ray to be strong. She tried to convince herself and her son that Jake would recover from this. He didn't waste a second as he activated the blessing of the dragon's eye right there and then. He surveyed his father's condition using his powerful eyes, and what he saw was demoralizing. His aura alone changed into a different color altogether, different from a normal human. He had never seen any living being with such a status before, even back in his days as a red dragon. Bro got the newest version of COVID. With a painful breath and a faint voice, Jake huffed and spoke sinisterly about how the shadows would kill everyone. He emphasized the shadows repeatedly with his limited speaking capacity. One of the armored soldiers explained that unfortunately, Jake had been infected with the plague of the shadows. He was attacked by a fearsome shadow beast while trying to protect a villager. These shadows and the plague of the shadows, no matter how hard Ray tried to recall, he had truly never seen anything like them before. When did they appear? And what happened to this world after he, as the legendary red dragon, died? The plot thickens. Starlet turned to the armored soldiers and sincerely thanked them for carrying her husband back home. The soldier felt even worse at the kindness of the kind woman. He deeply apologized for failing to protect Jake. At the side of the bed, Ray focused on tinkering with his system prompt. He thought that maybe, just maybe, he would be able to help his father recover with that spell. In his previous life as the legendary Red Dragon, one of the high-tier spells he used to know had the ability to dispel all forms of curses and black magic. With how mighty he was back then, his spells were no joke at all. But at the current moment, he does not know how he can unlock that spell again. If he were to bank on getting it as a reward for killing a magic beast, then he reckons it would probably need to be a high-ranking magic beast. He clenched his fist in frustration. As he is right now, he was just far too weak to even think about it. He faced his mom and sincerely asked if he would get much stronger if he could join the prestigious Avrian Knight Academy. Seeing her little boy ask such a determined question, Scarlet was rendered speechless. She looked her son directly in the eye as tears started to well up once again. She reassured Ray that he would become stronger than ever. Avrian Knight Academy was the place that his father, Jake, studied in the past. She is certain that her son will become an outstanding warrior, just like her husband is. With a newfound drive in his heart, Ray had finally made up his mind. He vowed to his mother that he would ace the test and become a student of the respected Avrian Knight Academy so that he can find a way to save his old man. Bro went from wanting to destroy humanity to doing whatever he can to save a single human. Seeing her boy take on such a huge burden with such youthful vigor, she could not help but well up in tears for the nth time today. She grabbed and hugged him tightly as she expressed her true belief that if anyone can do it, it will be Ray. She wholeheartedly believes in her son. Meanwhile, in a faraway land, in a dark and menacing religious building, a massive and menacing dark crystal ball was situated in the middle of an encirclement of mysterious people draped in black robes and hoods. There's always going to be that one cult, man. They looked at the images inside the magical dark crystal ball and concluded that the prophecy has been foretold, and a great change shall befall this world they live in. Every single one of the figures stared intently at the image of a young boy with vibrant red hair as they wondered what exactly he will bring unto the world. Would it be redemption and prosperity to the people, or would it be calamity and destruction to everyone? The future is yet to be determined, and no one truly knows what will happen. An elderly man wearing a dark hood ordered the other members to notify the knights regarding the prophecy. They must find the boy with red hair as soon as they possibly can. Out of nowhere, 
a mysterious figure that the other members of the congregation address as the Master Elder walk through the halls. He simply declared that if the boy brings redemption, then they shall lead his way. But if he brings an unprecedented calamity, destruction without hesitation is the way to go. This old man thinks he's so tough. Colorful banners adorned the streets, and the festive mood could be felt in the air. The townspeople went out and gathered while patiently waiting for something to come. The chatter of excitement was infectious. Some people had even lined up before dawn to secure a good place with a good view of the main event. Finally, the people saw what they had been waiting for, and cheers and applause could be heard as they raised the red flags in their hands. The parade of armored knights and luxurious carriages was met with celebration and festivities, but what the commoners were looking forward to seeing were the heavily armored men in front of the majestic green banner. Every single townsfolk tried to catch a glimpse of these special people as they hailed the men to the highest degree. These guys have a lot of clout. One of the men was the blonde and handsome Sir Delbert, sitting atop his trusty steed. The women couldn't help but swoon and fall deeply in love with his dashing looks. Bro has the silent knight raise perfected. Everyone in town could only see the knights once a year, on the day of examinations. They savored every moment they could lay eyes on the elegant master knights. At the end of the parade, the knights and troops finally arrived at the center of the town. In front of the massive town hall stood the impressive town square. A singular magic puppet could be seen in the middle of the square as the three master knights stood before the young hopefuls who wanted to get a shot at entering the Avrian Knight Academy. With a drop of a sword, the cheers of the crowd were silenced as one of the master knights began to speak. He welcomed everyone for going out of their way to witness the knight examination. He introduced himself as Winford, a knight of the prestigious Avrian Knight Academy. He's giving off such a strong mentor vibe. Standing on his right was the handsome Sir Delbert, and to his left was the stalwart Sir Bernardo. He was sure that these people already knew them all too well. Today, they would be the ones acting as proctors of the examination. This assessment would be open to all children age 5 and above. The audience continued to cheer as the event was about to start. If these children wanted to join the Avrian Knight Academy, they had to show everyone what they were truly made of. Among the hopefuls trying their best to get into the academy, two familiar faces could be seen. Ray was wearing a hood, covering his red hair, with a strong will emanating from his eyes, and Gary was up front with an optimistic smile on his face. Winford declared that the sword puppet was now in position, and the candidates could step up one by one as the first test officially started. Jake really pulled some serious strings to get one of these puppets for his son. Get well soon, man. The air of the town square was thick with anticipation as a boy with a heavy frame slowly walked towards the sword puppet with a wooden sword in his hand. In his mind, this was just a simple wooden puppet. He thought he had nothing to worry about as he could simply bulldoze and defeat it with pure strength. He readied his sword as the sword puppet assumed its proper stance. The parents of the kid cheered loudly for their son standing out from the crowd with their enthusiastic support. With a smacking sound, the fat boy was sent flying into the air without even being able to land a single strike. He failed the challenge against the sword puppet in just a single second. The parents of the kid were shocked into silence and embarrassment as they witnessed their boy being wiped out. After getting destroyed by the puppet, you better get ready to be whooped by your parents. Sir Bernardo promptly declared the failure and called out to the next examinee. As Ray's father had said to him before, he just needed to defeat a level 1 wooden puppet. He evaluated the level of the puppet in the town square. It looked like it wouldn't move from its place, but the speed at which it defended and counterattacked was on par with an adult. With a sharp hearing, Ray happened to overhear the conversation of the knights at the town square. Sir Delbert was whispering about how it was a waste of time to come to this irrelevant town. Oh snap, Sir Delbert is a brat. I'm not even surprised. Sir Winford simply reasoned and reminded Sir Delbert that they must follow the orders of the elders. Even Ray was shocked that he could hear them whispering from such a huge distance. It seemed that after obtaining more beast crystals, totaling 36 now, his senses had become sharper than ever before. The dashing Sir Delbert insisted that knights should only come from noble blood. He couldn't see the point in wasting time testing these filthy and worthless commoners. Even Sir Winford found this sentiment from the blonde knight a little too much. They had been going on for far too many rounds, and not a single candidate had been successful. Just as the knight expressed his impatience, the sound of a wooden sword hitting the ground resonated throughout the town square. Sir Bernardo loudly declared that Gary had passed the knight examination. The villagers in the crowd cheered loudly, boasting that they had known all along that this kid was something else. Gary wiped the sweat off his brow from his hard work as his eyes scanned the area of the examinees. Once he found who he was looking for, he gave a thumbs up and a genuine bright smile. Bro looks like a commercial model or something. 
After observing Gary's actions at the forefront of the stage, Ray blushed in embarrassment as the kid was clearly staring and gesturing directly at him. Lil Pro converted Gary from a hater to a fanboy, becoming the center of attention in the entire town square. Veteran Sir Winford's interest was piqued by Ray, while Sir Delbert's expression darkened as soon as he saw a kid with red hair. As Ray removed his hood, revealing his red hair for everyone to see, the crowd erupted with malicious murmurs and whispers. They dubbed him as the infamous cursed child who brought nothing but misfortune, even to the point of affecting his own father. They protested that such a monster could not become a knight at all. Sir Bernardo beckoned Ray to prepare as the next candidate, informing him that he would have a minute before the test commenced. The disinterested Sir Delbert slowly approached from behind. He stated that he did not believe in prophecies at all. If the prophecy were true, it would mean that the red-haired kid would surely pass the test. He menacingly approached the sword puppet and tinkered with its settings from behind, catching the attention of Sir Bernardo. With a sinister look, he activated the level 3 trial of the sword puppet. As it was set in high gear, the puppet wasted no time and rushed towards its opponent. Both Sir Winford and Bernardo immediately noticed that there was something wrong with the puppet's configuration and shouted at the contender to watch out. As the puppet charged towards Ray, he maintained his composure, gripping his wooden sword with utmost confidence. The sound of the puppet's wooden foot echoed throughout the arena. It raised its sword, using as much power as it could muster in a single strike. Imagine going to an exam expecting an elementary school-level test and being bamboozled with a college-level one. Sir Winford knew that this was extremely dangerous. He swiftly drew his sword and shouted at Ray to move out of the way. A sable sharp swing reverberated throughout the entire town square. The worry of the veteran knight turned into pure shock as he witnessed what had just happened. Even Sir Bernardo and Sir Delbert were stunned and rendered slack-jawed by the quick result of the examination. The audience that had been badmouthing Ray just a moment ago fell silent alongside Gary. With a wooden sound and an empty noise of a drop, the head of the sword puppet was decapitated as it landed on the ground. Ray knelt on one knee as the level 3 sword puppet fell in front of him. Sir Winford's assistance was not needed at all. Sir Bernardo was unsure of what to do after witnessing this incredible sight. Sir Winford sheathed his sword and ordered his colleague to announce the result. Giving a meaningful glance, he congratulated Ray and announced that he had passed the Avrian Knight Academy examination. With a sigh of relief, Ray walked out of the town square toward his proud mother and the excited Gary. Blondie is about to become the biggest ride or die friend of all time. Back at the Talon household, Ray was finally bidding farewell. Lil Bro is moving out of the house at the mature age of five. He stood before his bedridden father, hoping that his voice could reach him. He informed his old man that he had passed the test, so he would be leaving the village together with the Knights of the Academy. He knew that Jake might not even be able to hear him right now but he reassured his father that he would find a way to heal him. It was a promise he would work towards. Seeing and hearing his once lively father respond only in ghastly groans, a hint of sadness could be seen in Ray's eyes. Scarlet called out to him, wanting her son to take something on his new journey. It was a water drop pendant that had been passed down in their family for generations. She hoped that this heirloom would bring her son good luck in the new chapter of his life. Holding the pendant, he expressed his determination before finally leaving, telling his mom to take care. With deep worry in her eyes, she reminded her boy to always take care of himself and remember that she would always be there if Ray ever felt troubled. He told his mother not to worry anymore, as he was a man now. With his backpack and sword in hand, the small steps of a young child grew farther and farther from his home and his mother. She couldn't help but shed a tear as she bid her only child farewell, unsure of how long it would be. At the outskirts of the city, the lush green foliage exuded beauty as the bright sky shone. Ray approached the Avrian Knight Academy delegation in the midst of preparing the carriages for their journey. With his arrival, everyone should be accounted for. With a welcoming smile, Sir Winford told him to come aboard, as the other boy was already waiting for him inside one of the carriages. Upon hearing that the other boy was already inside, Ray had an idea of who it might be. Lifting the entrance curtain of the carriage, his suspicions were proven correct. It was his village neighbor, Gary. Both of them blushed in embarrassment upon seeing each other and finding out that they were the only ones who had passed the examination. They sat at opposite ends of the small carriage, the extremely awkward atmosphere making both Ray and Gary fidget uncomfortably in their seats. These two are about to become a deadly duo in the future for sure. After traveling for a while, the sun set, and night fell. The beauty of the woods they were traversing was undeniable. Bizarre magic creatures and stalwart trees bore witness to the proud delegation of the prestigious Avrian Knight Academy. 
In an attempt to break the awkward atmosphere and the silent tension, Gary cleared his throat to get Ray's attention. Out of nowhere, Gary clumsily tried to apologize to Ray, catching him off guard. Gary lowered his head and sincerely apologized for beating up Ray back then and saying a lot of mean and offensive things. Lil Bro is more mature and respectful than most adults that I know. He got out of his seat and earnestly bowed in regret as he asked Ray for forgiveness for being such an idiot back then. Ray reassured him that it was fine since he was just a clueless five-year-old child. Besides, he had even saved him from the mob of villagers before. Ray considered the event forgotten. Gary pointed out that Ray spoke as if he weren't a five-year-old boy himself. With an awkward laugh, he tried to change the subject by asking Gary how Amy was doing. He hadn't noticed her today at all. Gary was taken aback. Thinking that his sister had already told Ray, it turned out that she was going to the Roland Magic Academy herself. Mage GF and Knight BF. He really is following his father's footsteps. This came as a surprise to Ray, as Amy had never even mentioned to him that she had the aptitude for magic. The forest was silent, except for the sound of the cavalry's hooves and the armored troops marching. Out of nowhere, the vanguard at the front of the caravan came to a halt as the knights promptly ordered everyone to stop. As soon as they halted, Gary and Ray felt that something was wrong. With the main character on board, you can't go from point A to point B without some BS happening. They peeked through the carriage curtain and saw a thick, dense fog covering the view. They had no clue what was going on. Sir Winford, riding atop his dark stallion, bellowed in front of him for something or someone unknown to come out. He made it known that they were knights of the Avrian Knight Academy, while asking the unidentified figure to identify themselves. A mysterious silhouette could be faintly seen as the dense fog started to unravel. Sir Winford was taken aback as he finally saw what was behind the mist. It was an adventurer wielding a bow and arrow. She desperately asked for help as she shivered vigorously. She introduced herself as Anne Woodwork from the Traceless Guild. Classic ranged weapon user running as her guild mates get wiped. As soon as she got close to the party, Anne collapsed in the arms of Sir Bernardo. It turns out that her team was attacked by the infamous Shadow Beasts. The dwarf like Sir Bernardo couldn't believe what he had just heard. He found it baffling that Shadow Beasts would appear in the area when they hadn't even come across a single magic beast on their way here since they departed. Sir Delbert puffed his chest arrogantly as he proposed that perhaps the beasts avoided them because they knew how strong the knights were. Since they were headed to Rennie, the veteran knight suggested that the exasperated adventurer should tag along with them on the way. She sincerely thanked Sir Winford for his good graces, as the town of Rennie would work well for her. Hearing this exchange, Gary was confused that they were going to Rennie instead of the Knight Academy. Sir Delbert smugly berated him for being stupid arrogantly stating that there would be no use in sending a bunch of kids to the front line. Bro really can't go one second without being a condescending sob. Sir Winford patiently explained that the Avrian Knight Academy was situated at the border, making it susceptible to an attack at any moment. The new recruits needed to train for a decade in the town of Rennie until they grasped the basics of battle before continuing their studies at the prestigious Knight Academy. This was the first time Ray was hearing this crucial piece of information. Ten years is an incredibly short time for a dragon, but it is an incredibly long stretch for a normal human. With his father's condition worsening bit by bit, he was uncertain whether his pops could wait for such a long time. You need to speed run this training, brother. With the adventurer in need taken care of, the caravan resumed their march onwards to Rennie. The forest remained misty as their field of vision continued to be limited. Gary was worried, thinking that the huntress was the only survivor in her party, and Ray's father was attacked by the mysterious shadow beasts as well if he remembered correctly. Even those veteran knights were shocked when they heard that it was done by the Shadow Beasts. He was clueless and nervous about what they should do if they encountered those monsters. As if it were a premonition, a massive purple paw of a beast came into view directly in front of the caravan's way. Ray was one of the first people to sense that something was off as he felt the presence of something sinister. Sir Winford hastily ordered everyone to prepare themselves as something big was coming. The two mags by his side had already taken their positions as they faced forward. It was a monstrous purple bear with a malicious purple aura and a combat scar on its forehead. Surrounding the menacing monster was a group of smaller beasts with the same intensity of malice. The monstrosity stared directly at the caravan as it let out a haunting and deep groan. That's Mama Bear and her bloodthirsty cubs. The bear with a sinister hue turned its attention toward the caravan in front of it, and fresh blood poured from its sharp teeth and strong jaws. The knights in the vanguard identified the beast as the Drop Bear King, along with its pack of Drop Bears. Sir Bernardo prepared his axe, while Sir Delbert and Winford drew their blades. This was no ordinary drop bear king, it had become a shadow beast as well. 
The monster let out an ear-piercing roar as it ordered the drop bear pack to charge and attack the humans in front of them. Once arrogant, Delbert now held his sword with visible wariness, while the rest of the knights did their best to keep track of the rushing beasts. It seems like trouble was not exclusively concentrated at the front of the caravan. It was also brewing in the middle and everywhere else as the greenery started to rustle and drop bears started to come out of hiding. The armored troops failed to notice the sneaky and clever drop bears creeping up behind the battling knights. They must fire some of these soldiers after the battle. When Sir Bernardo finally realized that a beast was about to attack him from behind, he panicked, knowing he couldn't dodge in time. With a swift motion and a seamless sound, first blood was spilled on the battleground in the middle of the woods. The one who initiated the defense of the caravan was none other than Ray. Wielding his trusty sword and saving the flustered Sir Bernardo from harm, Lil Bro is just addicted to making his superhero entrances. He praised the boy for reacting remarkably to the situation and reminded Gary and Ray, standing side by side with blades in their hands, to prioritize protecting themselves from now on. The knights at the forefront of the battle made quick work of the initial charge of the drop bears, cleaving every beast that dared enter their attack zone. However, they noticed that the big guy, the drop bear king itself, was not moving from its position. It seemed to be waiting for something. In the middle of the caravan, Gary struggled in his fight against the massive drop bears given his small frame. Aren't the adults supposed to protect these soon-to-be knights? They are useless as hell. As two of the clever beasts surrounded him, they managed to sneak in a claw strike at the back of the kid. It seemed like these shadow beasts were enjoying themselves too much. Ray jumped in and struck the shadow beast from behind, digging deep through its flesh. Once again, he made a clutch move and saved Gary from the claws of death. With bear blood all over his clothes and body, he reminded the kid to be extra careful. Ray's out here chilling on the sidelines while waiting to steal kills. I respect that. These drop bears were much stronger than the demonic wolves they had encountered before. The drop bear king finally made its move, executing another resounding war that conjured up a massive visible force of impactful energy. The area of effect was so strong that the armored troops were sent flying while the knights braced themselves. Ray assessed that just from this roar alone, the creature was far too strong for them. With a menacing look in its eyes and fresh blood dripping from its mouth, the drop bear king raised its paw and slowly pointed forward. If this thing pointed at you with those eyes, just accept your fate. The veteran noticed something odd as the boss monster was just standing there in place and not attacking or engaging at all. They continued to cleave countless drop bears, but they could not determine what these things wanted from them. To everyone's surprise, a wild shadow beast started to speak in perfect, albeit sinister, human language. While pointing forward, it stated that the shadows would never be defeated, and that they would take over the entire continent. What is bro waffling about right now? The knights and armored soldiers all stopped in their tracks as this was the first time that they had heard a beast speaking in a human tongue. The drop bear king continued, pointing out that whoever he was indicating was destined to fail, and those around them were destined to die. He's talking like every online gamer ever. Shadow beasts are just salty trash talkers confirmed. Hearing the chilling speech of the shadow beast, Ray suddenly felt a sense of dread. The knights were utterly confused by what the monstrous thing in front of them was saying, they figured the beast was just trying to threaten all of them. After ending its bone-chilling speech, the drop bear king mustered all its strength in its legs and jumped right off the ground, leaving an impact crater. The bear just dropped his speech and then dipped. Absolute giga-chad behavior. The knights remained clueless about the monster's intentions. They had appeared out of nowhere without personally engaging in combat. Sir Winford just heaved a sigh of relief as he reminded everyone to be thankful that the massive shadow beast had chosen not to fight, otherwise, they would not have been able to leave the place unscathed. In the middle of the caravan, Ray was lost in thought, feeling that the monster had been speaking directly to him earlier. He did not even notice that he obtained another beast crystal. The veteran knight went to the side of the children and praised how well they had reacted in a time of distress. He was certain that these two rookies would become outstanding knights in the future. Ray inquired if beasts usually talked like the bizarre monster they had just faced. It seemed that was not the case at all. Shadow beasts almost never appeared within the border, and in his long career as a knight, this was the first time Sir Winford had encountered one that could talk. In the back of his mind, he thought Ray's reaction to this chain of events had been unusual. He was way too calm, it was not how someone of his age should be reacting at all. That kid is older than you by like a million years. At a distance, the arrogant Sir Delbert was looking at Ray with a dark expression. He did not even bother to conceal the blatant disgust and contempt in his eyes. What is this jackass even mad about? Just hating for the sake of hating. 
Time flew by, and the journey went on without any further obstacles. On a bright sunny day, the caravan of knights and carriages finally arrived at Rennie Town. The armored troops of the town lined up to welcome the esteemed knights, leading them into the massive town gate. It was extremely strange that there seemed to be more guards posted than usual right from the entrance. The representative of Rennie Town troops greeted Sir Winford warmly. When asked why there were more guards posted than usual, they were informed that the Allure Kingdom had issued an Amber Alert, and every town and city was now under heavy guard. In the back, Anne Woodwork thanked the knights for escorting her back to the town. Sir Winford frowned upon receiving this news. An Amber Alert was no joke. It seemed that things had finally become serious. Gary was energetic and enthusiastic as everything felt new to him, while Ray remained calm, as he had more pressing matters on his mind. Sir Winford looked back at Ray, realizing that the continent was on the verge of an impending crisis sooner or later. He wondered if this kid might just be the child of prophecy who could save everyone. In Ray's mind, he reaffirmed his promise to his old man. He vowed that he would become a knight. Looking up at the buildings of Rennie Town, he knew that everything had only just begun for him. He hoped that his father could hold on and wait for him. The years kept coming, and they didn't stop coming until a decade had passed in the renowned Rennie Town. Massive time skip alert. In a classroom, the instructor asked the students a simple question. While most knights do not have the ability to use magic, they have command over another ability. She asked if anyone could give her the answer, and Gary raised his hand. The teenage Gary had grown significantly in the past 10 years. He answered that the knight's ability is called Chi. After practicing Chi, they would be able to enhance their bodies and their senses. Some practitioners of Chi can even break through the limits of a human body for short periods of time. The instructor was pleased with the thorough explanation that Gary gave. It seemed like he was well prepared. She followed up with another question, asking why Chi could only be practiced after the age of 15. She called out to Ray to answer the question. Gary felt nervous as the seat beside him was empty. Ray was not in the classroom. Being the loyal friend that he is, Gary covered for Ray and excused him, saying that Ray had just gone to the restroom. That's a good friend right there. The instructor sighed and redirected the question to another student named Sylvia. Sylvia was a stunning girl with ashen white hair, wearing luxurious battle gear. She promptly and clearly answered that practicing chi could put the body under an extreme amount of duress, and the developing organs of a human finished developing somewhere after the age of 15. So, in turn, practicing at this age minimizes any damage that may be taken by their bodies. The instructor praised Sylvia for the detailed answer. She took her seat as her eyes wandered towards the empty chair beside Gary. Oh snap, he already got the school beauty's attention. Just as the instructor was saying, every student in the lecture hall was now going to take their first steps on their journey. She hoped that everyone could keep everything they had learned here in mind and use it for their future endeavors. Outside of Rennie Town itself, the forest was lush, and the waterfalls were pristine. In the middle of the woods stood a massive boar beast, eyeing down a magic wolf beast. A familiar but deeper voice ordered the wolf named Nor to attack the monster in front of them. Yep, that's a Pokemon battle if I've ever seen one. Nor did not waste a single second and obeyed its master, opening its jaw and displaying its powerful sharp teeth. It rushed towards the boar beast. With a swift pivot, the three-eyed wolf beast used its sharp claws to bring down the hulking beast in a single blow. The boar crashed to the ground as Nor landed gracefully. From a distance, familiar red hair could be seen. The system notified him that he had obtained another beginner grade beast crystal. Confirming the choice to absorb its essence, the system commenced its process, and he completely soaked up the power of the beast crystal. The ferocious Nor came running back to him as if it were an excited puppy demanding pets from its master. The kid obliged, showering the good boy with praise. You have to give him a treat, bro. That's like the number one rule. After evaluating that this should be enough for today, Nor turned into its light form and was promptly absorbed by the kid. He was in a pinch, since if he went back any later, someone would totally flip out on him. As he was about to head back inside the town, the familiar sound of cavalry hooves could be heard coming out of the trade Cherus Woods. The glorious banner of Avrian Knight Academy and the figure of a veteran knight leisurely got closer. The knight on the stallion was surprised that this red-haired kid would be the first one he met as soon as he came back. It was Sir Winford coming back to Rennie Town. He praised the kid for being able to slip past the heavy guards of the town. Sir Winford is 100% immortal. Of course, the kid in question was none other than the teenage Ray. They truly grow up so fast. He joined the knights en route towards the town as he caught up with Sir Winford. He had truly grown a lot taller since they last met. Meanwhile, the veteran knight had not changed at all in the past decade. 
He was even keeping his age a secret from everyone. He had heard the instructors say that Ray was notorious for slipping out of the town to hunt magical beasts on his own. And it looked like he had quite a haul today. With a smug smile, he reasoned that if the Amber Alert had not been called off recently, he would have had a harder time slipping out. Ray was out here in the woods because he enjoys moving around outside more than just sitting in a classroom. Sir Winford reminded him that he was lucky he did not go any further. If the guards on the outer line see him, they will not hold back at all. With a serious expression, Sir Winford has some important things to say to Ray. Before coming back to Rennie Town, it seems like the veteran knight stopped by Ray's house back in the village. This piece of update halted Ray in his tracks. He needed to hear this news. It seems like his father's condition has not worsened whatsoever since Scarlet has been taking good care of him. She also wanted to relay a message to her son to not worry so much about them in the village. Despite the complicated emotions he is feeling inside, Ray politely smiled and thanked the veteran knight for the update. Even if he tried to cover what he is feeling with a smile, his downcast eyes cannot lie at all. He has continued his training in this past decade. Whether it be rain or shine, he did not miss a single day. He has pushed his physical body to its limits, but he hasn't unlocked any new abilities. Despite his back-breaking efforts, nothing has changed at all. And he does not have a clue what to do and what his next move should be. He should have done 100 push-ups, 100 sit-ups, 100 squats and a 10-kilometer run every day. Sensing that the kid is carrying a heavy burden, Sir Winford firmly tapped him on the shoulder and guided him forward. For now, they just must move and get back into the town. He tightened his grip as he encouraged the kid that he must buck up from now on since tomorrow is the day that he and the other rookies at Rennie Town are heading out to Avrian properly. The two walk closely together, the veteran knight cannot wait to see the other kids as well. Back at the Rennie Town entrance, a loud voice can be heard at the barracks of the town wall. There was a man screaming at the armored guard for acting clueless regarding what he was inquiring about. The guard reasoned that since the Amber Alert has been released already, they have no reason to stop anyone from going out of the town. And besides, there is no way a kid would go far anyway. The man with dark glasses was infuriated as he tried to remind the guard that the kid is special, and they need to know where he is at all times. While leisurely walking, the veteran knight along with Ray referred to the man as Alan. He turned around and greeted Sir Winford casually. His attitude turned back into being aggressive as soon as he saw Ray. This kid just keeps on sneaking out, no matter how many times Alan told him not to leave his line of sight. He keeps on playing hooky. We have lost count of how many times this has happened in just the past month. The frustrated Alan hit Ray for being such a pain in the ass. Winford tried to intervene and reason that it has been a month since the Amber Alert has been called off, so it should be alright. Ray hid behind the knight as he badmouthed Alan for being too strict. Anger ring him even more. Besides, Ray is going to leave soon anyway. After that, Alan would be free as a bird from his babysitting duties. But as long as Ray is still his student, Alan would not let him skip class. Sir Winford was caught in the middle of this silly situation. After a few moments at the beautiful Rennie Town Square, the weather is impeccable. A thundering announcement notified all the students to gather at the square at once as an emergency meeting is being held. Ray, with a bump on his head from Alan's lessons, casually slipped through the crowd and found Gary. Seeing that he came back so quickly, Gary already knew that this kid was caught. The cold and beautiful Sylvia blushed as she tried to steal a glance behind her and towards Ray. The rustling of a majestic scroll can be heard all throughout the town square. The person on the front stage introduced himself as the squire, Lancey. He is here to notify everyone that tomorrow, he will bring everyone to the Avrian Knight Academy. The entire journey will take them about seven days. With a dead serious expression, he warned everyone that if none of them wants to get into any trouble, they should listen to his orders. Every student simultaneously uttered that they understand. An armored soldier asked Sir Winford if the path they will take has been decided yet, and the veteran knight simply answered that they will take on the swamp. This put the armored soldier into panic mode. He thinks that the swamp is far too difficult for the children to take on this early. With a confident smile, Sir Winford sees it differently. These children are bound to face a lot of challenges to become knights. And besides, they are not the only ones getting tested. Looking at the students in attendance, we see a buff and strong-looking guy with teary eyes. He has the same peculiarity as Ray, bright red hair. It does not stop there. An identical twin with the same color is in attendance as well. There's even a spirited young man with shaved red hair celebrating the next step on their journey to knighthood. It seems like Ray is not the only red-haired boy that is getting marked by those who believe in the prophecy. Ayo, the plot actually thickens. The next day arrived, and as soon as the sun rose at the entrance of Rennie Town, 
the carriages and the whole caravan itself, with the knights at the vanguard finished setting up. Inside one of the carriages, Ray could be seen catching up on sleep as he drooled over himself. The red-haired kid named Kyle, who had a shaved head, asked the other kids on board why they hadn't used a teleportation device for convenience. They could have reached the destination directly with a single teleportation device, saving a lot of time in the process. A dark-haired kid named Dan mocked the rest of the group for being a bunch of idiots. He stated that, of course, there were no teleportation devices in the Avrian Knight Academy. Kyle argued that since they wanted to be on equal footing with the Roland Magic Academy, they should have a teleportation device like those mages do. Another voice interjected amidst their argument. The serene voice poked fun at them for not paying any attention in class. Sylvia, with a book in her hand, stated that since the Avrian Knight Academy was on the border, they not only needed to resist the invasion of foreign enemies but also had to fight against nether shadow beasts. If they set up a teleportation device there, once the academy was defeated, the enemies would be able to instantly teleport to all parts of the country. The two boys who were arguing earlier became embarrassed. Meanwhile, Sylvia blushed and still tried to take a sneak peek at the sleeping Ray. With the drooling red-haired kid sleeping on his shoulders, Gary turned to look and saw Sylvia glancing in their direction. She immediately turned her head away, but Gary spotted her. They had journeyed for a few hours, and the sun was about to set. They chose a nearby castle ruin to rest their weary bodies. As soon as the carriages arrived near the spot, the students were ordered to get off immediately and prepare for camping. Every student paired up and helped each other set up big tents to camp for the night. Gary whispered to Ray that he had spotted Sylvia constantly looking at him. Ray didn't think much of it, as he didn't believe there was anything special about him. To prove his point, Gary and Ray slowly turned their heads and looked at the girl. Sylvia was caught looking once again, and she blushed profusely. She was so embarrassed that she messed up the setup of their tent. Gary found this amusing, but Ray thought that Sylvia was only looking at him because of his weird red hair. However, Gary knew that this had been going on for a while now. Besides, Ray wasn't the only kid with red hair anymore. There were the twins, Sloth and Badger, brothers who were polar opposites when it came to their personality. There was also the buff and reliable Ian, a hard worker and a kind-hearted guy, a gentle giant with monstrous strength and a heart of gold. And there was the always lively Kyle, always upbeat and loud, a very sincere kid. Ray admitted that Gary had a good point regarding Sylvia's stares, but it didn't concern him at all. He didn't have the slightest interest in her, no matter how much Gary tried to tease him about how pretty she was. Behind the castle walls of the ruins, someone seemed to be sneaking away. It was the overly confident kid from the carriage, Dan. He even had someone called Monk with him. Monk was unsure whether they should be sneaking around like this, and after seeing the back of the castle walls, their noses were assaulted by a foul odor. The smell was so unbearable that it was worse than dead rats. The water emitted a nasty smoke, and they couldn't even see the full expanse of this sticky place. Taking a closer look, it seemed like this area was a swamp. Out of nowhere, Lancy the Squire appeared behind them with fury in his eyes. He confirmed that this was indeed a swamp, and if they didn't want their legs to get bitten off by the sharp worms because they were dozing off, he menacingly suggested that the two of them set up their tents and sleep immediately. The two cried in fear as they went back to the camp. The sun had completely set, and the only thing that could be heard was the crackling of the fire in the middle of the campsite. A single armored guard was stationed at the top of the ruined castle wall, surveying the area for any abnormalities. Below him, a quiet and nimble sound of something or someone sneaking around could be sensed. It was, of course, Ray. He had done some scouting during dinner time earlier. He was certain that he could slip away without having to deal with the guards in this area. The sharp bugs demonstrated their ferociousness with swift attacks and a disgusting slime. A training the pink hair was valiantly saved by Gary, who sliced down some bugs. This young girl is training to become a knight, but she is freaked out by the blood of bugs. As these monsters appear in swarms, Gary led the trainees to disembark from the cart and increase their vigilance. Gary, Ray, Sylvia, Dan, and the other red-haired Kyle were the first ones to compose themselves and face the swarm. Gary ordered them to form groups of three in the open area to strengthen their defenses. Energetic Kyle charged into the fray, challenging everyone to a contest of who could kill the most sharp bugs. Ray secretly activated his dragon's eye, wondering why these trainees were getting so excited. They collaborated in groups and effectively mowed down the enemies. Some of them killed tens of these bugs. However, these are all just beginner rank magical beasts, so Ray couldn't care less. But something else caught his attention that the other trainees probably did not notice. Up on the cliffs were the six knights who had left the group earlier. They were quietly observing the battlefield. 
Now that he saw what was going on, Ray decided to return to the carriage and board him, much to Dan's annoyance. After all, these were all weak beasts, his classmates could probably survive on their own. He really said, I'm too strong for this sheet. Right now, he'll just take this chance to get some peaceful sleep. The night, Lancey, evaluated that Ray could only achieve something known as a red belt. The knights thought that he got scared. On the contrary, Gary was receiving praise for his decisive attacks and for controlling his body with no wasted movements. The knights assessed that he would probably earn a white belt. Another trainee had also caught their eye for her presence of mind and perfect stance. It was, of course, none other than Sylvia with her deadly blade. Every time a sharp bug entered her killing range, she reacted masterfully. Every beast fell with a single, perfectly timed counter slash. A single opening spelled the end for her opponents. She was a smart and steady fighter overall. Things had been going well for the trainees until something emerged from the depths of the ground into the middle of the field. This caused a menacing rumble, a beast that resembled the sharp bugs they had been fighting the whole time. It turns out that sharp bugs can merge with each other to become a different level of monstrosity. The appearance of this fearsome beast threw the earlier confidence of the trainees out of the window. There are a few who stepped up in times of trouble, and one of those would be the red-haired Ian. With his raw strength alone, he ripped through the giant sharp bug to protect his comrades. The twins also demonstrated their skills with their blades. These two are a cut above the rest. Meanwhile, Kyle has been enjoying slaughtering these bugs with amazing efficiency and a smile on his face. Observing the trainees, it seems like there's no need for the knights to step up. The red-haired kids are standing out in their own ways, but Ray stood out for the wrong reasons. It did not take too long for the kids to take care of business despite the urgency and surprise. After the battle, Ian went to the side of the other trainees to make sure they're alright. Not only is he physically strong, but he also genuinely cares for his teammates. He's a gem, a perfect knight. And compared to Ian's valiant effort, Ray is out here stretching after his peaceful nap inside the carriage while Gary is scolding him for not helping. It seems like the identity of the child of prophecy is still a mystery at this point. After the battle, the caravan continued its way to its destination. Kyle is boasting that he killed the most sharp bugs out of every trainee here. He and Dan are thinking that magic beasts are not that tough after all. He also commented that if they are lucky, they can get a white belt based on their performance here alone. Gary had no clue what this white belt thing was. Ray, on the other hand, is extending his beauty sleep as much as possible. It turns out that even after becoming a knight, every personnel would still be ranked differently. For example, the knights that are supervising this trip are the White Tassel Protectors. They are the highest ranked knights in the academy. In their careers, they've earned the coveted white belts at one point. That means that their skills as knights have been recognized through rigorous tests and trials. There are also green and black belt knights, symbolizing different skills and specialties. But the lowest ranked among the knights are the red belts. The people who do not do well in tests can only get this one. White belt trainees will not only be given personal instructors but also abundant resources and rewards as well. But on the other side of the spectrum, red belts are an unlucky bunch. They will only get basic training, and no one would pay attention to them. They can honestly do whatever they want since the academy has practically given up on their potential. Hearing this was quite eye-opening for Ray. If red belts can do whatever they want, he would have all the time in the world to hunt magic beasts to grind beast crystals and abilities quickly. And that solidified his goal in this prestigious knight academy. He will do his best to get a red belt. Seeing the glorious banners displayed on the tall walls of the garrison, the caravan had finally arrived at their destination. The gates alone looked like a hundred stories tall in the eyes of the trainees. This overwhelming sight is the prestigious Avrian Knight Academy itself. Beyond the great walls is a place so massive and impressive that it does not look like an academy at all. Of course, they'd heard about this place before, but seeing it with their own eyes for the first time is just a different experience. The entire academy is actually a whole city where every citizen is a knight. Their energy source comes from mana crystals placed all over the place. Not a single torch is used for lighting. It's as luxurious as it is prestigious. It is a vastly different world compared to the small village that Gary and Ray grew up in. Sir Lancey reminded them to follow closely for the tour to not get lost. They would have the chance to wander around later anyways. Their first stop is the armory, where every staff treats Sir Lancey with the utmost respect. The next one is the library, so they must shut their mouths and keep quiet. It looks like Sir Lancey is quite popular with the Lady Knights. As for the librarians, they are bona fide knights too. All graduates of the Avrian Knight Academy are required to volunteer in the city for two years. Then they will be allowed to either stay or leave. Their last stop is one of the most important spots in the academy. 
Before everyone heads to their dorms, they must visit this one. The trainees are either scared or confused because, based on the tombstones, this is a cemetery. But something else caught Ray's attention. In this place, the remains of the knights who have fought and died for the Allure Kingdom rest. They'd have come here to be reminded that the war has never ended. Every trainee must remember that as valiant knights of the kingdom, their first duty is to fight and protect their home. Of course, every trainee was moved by that speech and answered affirmatively in unison. Except Ray. He was reminded of his hate for humans at this burial site. He trembled in rage and could barely contain his boiling emotions. These puny humans dared to use the bodies of his dragon brethren as materials to make their armor and weapons. Sylvia raised her hand and respectfully asked who these imposing sculptures were made after. These figures represent the founders of the Avrian Knight Academy. They were dubbed as the legendary Dragon Knights. Intrigue, Ray asked what exactly these Dragon Knights were. The annoyed Sir Lancey just dismissed his question, as the trainees would know this stuff after studying the Academy's history. Beefing with a literal child is crazy. This raised Ray's anger even further as his blessing of the dragon's eye manifested out of his control. This led him to notice something even more peculiar on this site. As the tour concludes, Gary is worried that Ray is standing still and acting differently. Thanks to his dragon's eye activation, he started seeing something truly incomprehensible. Below one of the tombstones, there was a massive hole going deep into the earth, and there was something in there. Upon further inspection, he started seeing that the thing below that hole was alive. Now that the tour is finally done, everyone scattered to find their dorms. Gary is excited for this new chapter in his life, while Ray is lost in thought about what he just saw earlier. It puzzled him even more because not even magical beasts would have that sort of presence. Noticing that he's lost in his own thoughts, Gary finally snapped him out of it. Thankfully, the two of them happened to be assigned to the same dorm. As for who would be their other doormates, a particular trainee they are acquainted with is listed on the door. Much to her surprise, Sylvia is assigned to the same room as the boys. Gary explained that it's not really all that surprising. Considering that the Academy has always treated everyone equally regardless of gender, reassuring her that they're nice at least. In response, she just threw her heavy bag at him. She clearly does not like the idea of sleeping in the same room as them. She stormed off, throwing a fit as she headed to the officials to change dorms. At the same time, their other doormates arrived at the scene. They would be rooming with Monk and the gentle giant, Ian. Ray eyed his fellow red-haired freak intensely. It looks like they have two more roommates, Dan and someone called Marsha Woodward. A name that somehow sounds familiar to Ray. It did not take too long for Sylvia to storm back downstairs in a poorer mood. She was forced to grab her bag back. He warned the boys that she would be changing clothes. With murder in her eyes, she certainly warned them not to come in. Just as Gary expected, the administration did not allow her to change dorms after all. Finally, Dan arrived, and Gary welcomed the guy with open arms. He then went on to tell Dan that they found a big cockroach inside the room and were looking for someone to deal with it. The thing is, Dan is a big show-off. Everyone watched as he stormed into the room, ready to deal with a measly cockroach. A brief moment of silence washed over everyone on the other side of the door. A scream of horror and shock echoed in the halls. A sign of a perfectly executed prank. Sensational. Gary and Monk laughed. Ray was speechless at this devious stunt. And poor Ian's pure heart could not take it. A few moments later, it's now lunchtime at the massive dining hall of the Academy. Dan is worried that now that he's pissed off the walking gunpowder, Sylvia, she might kill him in his sleep or something. Gary and Ray are barely paying attention to the poor guy while they wolf down everything on their plates. They were talking about Sylvia, as if she's not sitting right in front of them. She could not even believe that everyone is eating carelessly, as if they are not going to be tested soon. The test for the night belts is coming up, but Gary and Ray could care less for the duo, free food is all that matters. She could only sigh in defeat against their appetite. And that's when a pair of smug training knights went to their table to mock them for eating like beasts, as expected of poor country bumpkins with no manners. They then laugh at them, expecting that this group would be crying to their mommies after a few meals in this institution. They made their way towards the docile Ian, mocking his large size and how much space he takes up. But these smug fools made their biggest blunder. They dared to mock the red-haired freaks out of Rennie. The always cheerful Kyle paused his lunch. One of the twins is ready to kill as he raises his blade covertly. But the calmer twin did not deem it worthy. The smug bullies continued to insult them for being country bumpkin freaks until Monk decided to stand up for his roommate. This only shifted the target onto him. He was mercilessly trash-talked while Ian tried to de-escalate the situation. Seeing this as a sign of weakness, the scoundrel told Ian to take the long way around if they see each other in the future. But out of nowhere, 
A flying chicken leg zoomed through the air. It smacked the smug son of a gun right in the face with impressive force. This, of course, angered the imbecile cursing out whoever humiliated him in front of everyone to come out. To his surprise, the culprit would not only show himself but would also plant the guy's face into the table. Ray twisted the moron's arm in a lock while asking him who he was trash-talking. The guy could not take the hint and called Ray a disgusting red-haired monster. Unfortunately, a nosy trainee tattled to the officials, and the hateful Sir Lancey was the first to notice the commotion. Ian saw Ray's murderous eyes and tried his best to stop the situation from getting out of hand. They can't make a ruckus here with all the knights watching. And with the tests fast approaching, this would affect their impression of Ray, but he could not care less. The other moron continued to badmouth Ray from a distance while crying for the knights to save his moron partner from Ray's violence. Sir Lancey went up to the table and ordered Ray to release the half-wit. Ray should just take them two versus one. While the moron cried out for the knight's help, Ray wanted to teach Ian something he had learned growing up about people who treat others like trash. Sir Lancey remained firm and officially ordered Ray Talon to stop his actions immediately. You see, the only way to deal with these people is to show them the consequences of their actions. And sometimes, force is necessary. As the fool cried in pain with his arm, the other trainees watched in horror. Ray knew better than anyone that people only learn when you teach them a lesson. But this earned him the anger of Sir Lancey for not following explicit orders. He retorted that he just had hearing problems like Lancey himself. He also only hears what he wants to. Emotional damage. He then went back to his seat with Gary to continue eating, not letting those pieces of trash affect his appetite. After seeing Ray do that to the bullies, the surrounding whispers quietly praised him. This further infuriated the knight. Right now, he had his eyes officially set on Ray. As lunch in the halls continued, the three commanders arrived on the scene. With the arrival of these three, whispers of anticipation about the test began to spread. Sir Winford silenced everyone with a wave of his hand and an order to be quiet. He then welcomed the heads of the academy, the six elders themselves. With the appearance of these masked figures, it seemed like the test was a big deal this time around. In the history of the academy, no one had heard of the six elders watching the test before. Using his dragon's eye, Ray analyzed these six people. And the only thing he was certain of was that these elders were way too strong. They gave him the menacing vibe of the humans that ultimately ended his previous life. That means that the elders of this academy can probably go toe-to-toe -to -toe with dragons. Today, they would be serving as witnesses as the testing of the new knight to be commenced. According to the results of this test, every trainee would be given belts of different colors. As everyone had heard before, if you didn't do well, you would get a red belt. This essentially meant that you had failed, in a sense. But today, Sir Winford wanted to throw that stigma out of the window. Getting a red belt would not stop anyone from standing where he stands today. Every single one of these trainees had been painstakingly selected for their potential since they were five years old. The future training would help them hone their talents, so Sir Winford pleaded with everyone not to give up on themselves. As Ray expected, the noble knight was as positive and encouraging as ever. He wondered how the guy would react when he ultimately got a red belt. After that moving speech, he would then lead the rest to Lancey. Sir Lancey swore to fulfill his duties as best as he could while explicitly shooting a furious glare at Ray. They need to take this guy's license or something. The examination consists of five different stages testing various aspects of a knight's overall ability. The first one is a test of raw strength, involving pushing a massive boulder known as the Stone of Power. Next is the challenge against the roaring flames of the blazing inferno. The third stage involves the stealthy navigation of an undetected passage. For the fourth stage, they must undergo a test of accuracy in the eye of precision. Finally, there's a measure of a knight's values in the pursuit of truth. After that rundown, Everyone transferred to the venue for the first stage, where the Stone of Power challenge will commence. It's a massive coliseum adorned with magic stones on the sides. The rules are simple, they need to push a big rock to the goal position. Once it reaches the goal, the stage is considered successful. Each participant will have two chances, and if they fail in first attempt, they can choose to use a pair of magic gloves on the second try. These gloves increase strength and assist in passing the stage, but participants must keep in mind that it will affect their evaluation. This simple strength test appears easy for Gary and Ray. However, Ray has already noticed that someone doesn't want him to succeed. Speaking of the devil, Sir Lancey has something to announce before they begin. As the proctor of this test, he wants to formally reject Ray Talon's participation. Are you serious right now, bro? This was well within Ray's expectations, but his friends protested this decision. Lancey intends to use this situation as a warning for all trainee knights. 
insisting that they must follow any orders given by superiors above all else. If anyone objects to his decision, they are free to report him to his superiors. And if ordered to retract it, he will comply without objections. Putting that aside, the first test finally starts. Now that it's clear that Lancey is targeting him, Sylvia wants to appeal to the higher-ups. However, Ray doesn't want to do so, making things easier for him. He'll just join everyone in the next stage. Right from the start, he's certain that he will be guaranteed the lowest red belt. But Sylvia is genuinely worried for Ray. The test goes on, and Gary passes while gritting his teeth. Sylvia also manages to pass on her second try with the help of the magic gloves. However, Ian is in a leave of his own, easily lifting the rock when he only needed to push it. Ray congratulates Gary for passing, but he knows that the second stage will likely be a tough challenge for him. These foreboding words from Ray unnerve Gary. Looking at the proctor of the second stage, the old man appears to be from the Roland Magic Academy. When it comes to magic, they have never even touched the subject. But Ray knows that the battlefield does not care whether you've learned something or not. He guesses that they have to try resisting magic, and usually, physically strong people have worse magic resistance. Based on his assumption, the Academy is trying to test their weaknesses and strengths through these five tests to find the best way to develop their abilities. If that's the case, Gary is hoping for the possibility that he's an all-rounded genius, but that's highly unlikely. And so, the second stage, Blazing Inferno, starts with Gary going up first. Under the spell of the Proctor, he lasts 57 seconds. Ray praised his buddy for lasting reasonably long, but Gary was disappointed that he did not even last a full minute, even though a minute is equivalent to an hour inside the illusion. Next up on the block is none other than Sylvia as the Proctor started her test. She maintained mental clarity with the knowledge that everything she's experiencing is just an illusion. Even though her clothes had been burned in the illusion, she stood firm. It's already been five minutes, and she's still holding strong. She's leagues ahead of the second place. Now that she's proven how resilient she is against magic, she became the talk of the town for the other trainees. Next up on the chopping block is Ray, and Sylvia gave him a quick good luck before undergoing the test. The proctor prepared to start the test while he formulated that 20 seconds should be about enough. But a much better bet would be giving up immediately. From the stands, his bright red hair stood out. He entered the illusory world and waited for the incoming trial. But he was surprised to see what exactly this trial entailed. He was facing an image of a fearsome red dragon. It enveloped him with a blazing flame as he wondered why he was facing himself from his past life. In an interesting turn of events, the test sent both Ray and the Proctor flying in opposite directions. Even the knights in the stands were shocked to see this development. The elders quietly watched and observed the bizarre event taking place. The Proctor then started screaming that Ray was cursed, that he had been cursed by the Red Dragon. The trainees heard this crazy old man's words, and it changed the way they saw Ray for the worse. Sir Winford assured Ray that the old man is alright and that he should rest up too. But this is truly strange. This established mage's mana has been completely drained, but that doesn't make sense. He reported to the Elder that it's just a mana disorder caused by excessive mana use. But the Elders know that a renowned mage from Roland should not be drained to this extent after just a test of this degree. Now that the mage is resting, Winford suggested having another mage take the Proctor role for the remaining tests, and the Elder agreed. As Sir Winford takes his leave, that same Elder silently ordered an Armored Knight. The Armored Knight assured the Elder that the task will be done immediately. This old man is rocking that COVID-19 drip, complete with the mask and all. He is intrigued by the young man known as Ray Talon. The boys do not know what the hell a mana disorder is, Sylvie had to explain that it happens to mages who drain their mana but forcefully cast magic anyway. Ray just attributed his unlucky streak to being a genius. Geniuses always have it hard after all. But even Sylvia knows that a prominent mage from Roland should not make such an elementary mistake. And there's also the thing about the curse. But as the three were minding their business hanging out together, the ground started to shake with rigorous rumbling. Suddenly, sounds of something coming out of the ground echoed throughout the Colosseum. Amidst the earthquake, massive tree trunks started to protrude up into the field. When the rumbling slowed, the onlookers were greeted with a sight of massive forest. It was conjured up by a powerful hooded mage. This is the extent of what magic can do. Covering the entire testing area with greenery is no joke. Meanwhile, inside the thick forest made of magic, the trainees are confused as to what was happening. That was until someone stepped into the scene, perched atop one of the tall trees. This person notified the trainees that the third stage starts now. This coated and masked figure introduced himself as the proctor of the third stage. All they have to do is follow him and replicate his movements as best as they can. 
This is the start of the third trial, the undetected passage. The proctor vanished in a blink of an eye to signal the start of the third test. This test is giving off Naruto vibes. They are suddenly starting, and no one has digested what's happening yet. Ray was impressed by the proctor's speed. Monk was the first one to react and jumped into the trees. Ray and Gary followed suit, excited to demonstrate their speed in the familiarity of the woods. Sylvia also jumped into the chase, leaving only one person behind. Dan was the slowest to react out of all of them. He's still at the starting point while everyone else is accelerating already. After a few moments of no one catching up to him, the proctor started to think that he's going too fast for the kids. As he was about to stop and wait to adjust his pace, he looked behind and saw a pleasant surprise. It was Monk at the forefront, easily traversing through the branches with Gary, Ray, and Sylvia close behind. Seeing the trainees slowly catching up to him, the proctor deemed that there was no need to take it easy after all. He went ahead of them, taunting the trainees to catch up if they could. But as they passed a certain point, we saw five arrows loaded up into one bow, lying in wait. As time went on, Ray acknowledged that he was not that good when it came to traversing the woods like this. He was running out of stamina fast because he preferred moving with all four of his limbs for comfort and speed. Suddenly, those arrows were unleashed upon the trainees as soon as they got in range. Ray was the first one to sense the incoming attacks from the shadows. He warned the kids ahead of him to look out for the incoming arrows. Thanks to that warning, everyone managed to stop their charge before falling victim to the trap. The woman wielding the bow complained that there were too many kids that had passed the first part of the exam proctored by the masked man. She taunted the kids to not just stand there and lose to the masked man. Also, that they should each grab a bow. She blended into the background with a declaration that their next test started now. It seemed like they would be undergoing the third and fourth stages at the same time. They would be tested on their accuracy with a bow. They did not take too long to prepare for the next part. Targets had been set up in the forest ahead. They would pass the test after hitting three. But of course, they had to do so under the fourth proctor's constant interference. This was the fourth stage of the night exam, the Eye of Precision. The fourth proctor can low-key catch this arrow, if you know what I'm saying. Ray was still aiming to hit a red belt but he did not want to come in last place either. So, he decided to activate his dragon's eye to show off just a little bit. But thanks to that eye of his, he saw the trajectory of a special arrow zooming through the air with deadly force. At first, he was confused because this was supposed to be a harmless test. The arrow was headed straight for Gary. So he pushed his friend away while yelling at him to watch out. Now that he's pushed Gary away from harm, it dawns on him that he can't dodge this incoming attack. Thankfully, its trajectory was deflected by another arrow coming in from a different angle. That special arrow did not lose any momentum and lodged itself into a nearby tree forcefully. No matter how you look at it, that one was too strong for just a simple test. Their clutch savior came right up to them to make sure that they were alright. It was a young lady trainee carrying her bow with finesse. She's a great shot, but she's also modest when praised. Before they could exchange more words, another batch of arrows came right at them. They started adjusting to the speed and easily dodging the shots, but something is not quite right. The one that came at them just now was enveloped with chi, unlike the test arrows from the proctor. Someone really is trying to kill them, or maybe, they just want to kill Ray specifically. From a covered angle in the woods, the sound of another arrow being pulled back can be heard, but this one is not coming from the proctor. She and Ray were the only ones to hear that unsettling pull. Now that he knows where the attacks are coming from, Ray prepares to retaliate with his own bow but he pulls on the arrow so hard that the bow starts to crack. Unable to withstand his power anymore, the wooden bow finally snaps under his forceful grip. He might have been too hyped to unleash his own ranged attack. You gotta stick with swords, my boy. Now that the proctor has caught on to what was happening, she releases a chi-powered arrow herself. It is easily dodged by the mysterious figure running through the covers of the woods. She investigates the signs left by the intruder, but there are zero signs to follow. To be able to dodge her all attack without leaving a trace behind is crazy. Someone powerful is hunting down her students. She takes her arrow back from being lodged into one of the giant trees. She does not want the trainees to panic, so she casually reasons that one of her shots went astray and they should just continue the test. Ray knows that this proctor clearly didn't shoot that arrow, she's just trying to reassure them. They went ahead. But Ray kept his guard up now that someone extremely dangerous managed to sneak into the woods. The test wrapped up a few minutes later, it seems like everyone had decent results this time around. Sylvia was shocked to learn that something grave had just happened to Ray and Gary in that forest. As always, she wanted to go and report the incident to the knights, but Ray wanted to keep this one under wraps. Gary is on the same page too. The proctor didn't tell them the truth, that might mean she was trying to reassure them, 
but she might also be trying to hide something. If someone is really trying to cause them harm, that person must be someone who'd enter the venue unnoticed. That means the identity of the assailant is limited to a very small pool. It might be a proctor or maybe a related knight. I personally got my eyes on that rat, Lancy. As for how they would proceed from here, Ray wants to stay still to see how it goes. He's deadly curious about who's the moron targeting them. They go over the edge of the conjured forest and into one of the Coliseum's exits where the intruder made his landing. The fourth proctor managed to catch up and stop the man from making his cover exit. She angrily asked the assailant why he's targeting her new students. At their close distance, she's confident that she can shoot this man down on the spot if she needs to. But if that is the case, the intruder with a scar on his eye has no other choice. There is nothing more to say as he chooses to face her chi-enforced arrow with his blade. A scarlet crystal illuminated the surroundings under the dark skies of the Colosseum. This gem, attached to this sword, will be used to test the trainee's willpower and chi manipulation. The fifth and final stage of the examination is starting. The Will of Truth and the hateful Sir Delbert will be the final proctors. The sword in front of them is made from an Ultra Beast crystal from a Firebird. It releases flames when held. The trainees have not learned how to use chi yet, so they will be relying on pure willpower. Sir Delbert called for the first student to come up, it was Ian who would be trying out first. He anxiously held the blade, waiting for it to react to his will. It then suddenly ignited into a massive flame that caught him by surprise, shocking even Delbert. It might be an impressive fire, but control does not seem to be there. Meanwhile, on the other side of the academy, someone is receiving a report from the assailant in the woods. It was someone called Elder Gibby. He did not seem to mind the intruder's negative report, knowing that their issue is quite complicated. He donned a golden mask to change his appearance in just a second. Their interference in the exam has undoubtedly sent a signal to their followers. A signal that tells them that the Pure Blood Guild has never disappeared. Imagine using a shape-shifting mask to look like a creepy old man. That couldn't be me. Back in the final test, it was Mount Gary's turn, and he managed to conjure up a glorious and formidable flame. Now, Ray is up next, so Gary gave him a high five and wished him good luck. Sylvia went up to Gary to ask about something that's been on her mind. She wants to know if Ray is actually really strong. With Gary being the closest to Ray, at least to his knowledge, Ray is extremely strong. He stood by this evaluation despite the kid's abysmal test results and even after winning against Ray in spars. That's because of what happened 10 years ago. He recounted the story of how he was attacked by an intermediate ranked demonic wolf, where Ray saved him and defeated the beast. Dad did not take this story seriously, as he thinks it would be an impossible feat for a five-year-old boy to do that at the time. He thinks it's probably just some ordinary big wolf. But Sylvia was not that quick to dismiss that story. If Ray really was that strong, then she's clueless as to why he would hide his real abilities. Now that it's Ray's turn to go up to the stage and use his will on the blade, his cute draconic avatar appeared. As soon as he touched the hilt, he was prompted with the option to absorb the treasured ultra-grade beast crystal. It's free. Real estate. Given that the crystal immediately lost its scarlet luster, it's evident what option Ray had gone with. He feigned ignorance while swinging the sword with no flames at all, surprising even Sir Delbert. Realizing what was happening, the knight shoved Ray away in a panic while he checked the sword. The weapon created from an ultra-grade beast crystal, a treasure of the Allure Kingdom has lost its power. He instantly grabbed Ray, blaming the trainee for whatever happened to the sword, but he just shrugged it off and continued to act clueless. He even called out this moron for staring at him like crazy since he went up to take the test. As the situation escalates, an armored knight hurriedly went up to the stage with an urgent report. Whatever that whispered report was, it evidently shook Sir Delbert to his core. He then signaled the end of the tests, and the trainees can return to their rooms now. Their long day has finally wrapped up, they are to gather at dinner time to be assigned their belts. Contrary to the other trainees, Ray doesn't look relieved. Sir Delbert dismissed him while his mind was still reeling. Due to his super sensitive hearing, he heard everything that the armored knight reported to Sir Delbert. He was being notified that the proctor of the fourth test was just found dead. When the knights and Sir Winford found her, she was already mangled using a blade. Her body is still warm, so it hasn't been very long since she passed. They have no clue as to who in the world the culprit is. Winford took charge and assigned the other knights to report the matter to the elders with haste. In the elder meeting room, the leaders of the academy have been briefed about the death of the fourth proctor at the hands of a skilled assailant. All evidence points to it being a possible internal case concerning certain groups. This could be the work of either the Pure Blood Guild or the Dark Guild. Either way, the death of the captain of the Green Belted Knights must be thoroughly investigated. As they cannot decide on the next course of action, the elders turn to the head elder for advice. 
The head elder wanted to contain this incident within these doors while the knight captains conduct the investigation. Meanwhile, the time for the bestowment of ranks is approaching, and every trainee is anxious about the color of their belt. It turns out that their other lady doormate is the one who saved them with an arrow earlier, Martha Woodwork, daughter of Anne Woodwork. Ray is still distracted by the death of the fourth proctor right within the academy's confines. The culprit could only be a commander or an elder. If you can remember the adventurer they saved on their way to Rennie years ago, that woman was Martha's mother. Gary noticed that this kid has had his head in the clouds an awful lot lately, thinking about everything that happened in the test. Ray thinks it's best not to tell them about the killing to avoid any more unnecessary danger. Throughout the five tests, even Sylvia noticed that unusual events surrounded Ray. At that moment, the night commanders have finally arrived. Every trainee in the large hall fell silent with nervousness and anxiety about their ranks. Here now, they will be handed their night belts. Everyone must come up as they hear their name. First up on the list is none other than our boy, Gary Blueblood. Whispers of praise regarding his outstanding performance surrounded him. He did the best overall out of everyone. They grow up so fast. One could argue that Sylvia did better, but regardless, she and Gary would probably receive the highest ranks. However, upon careful consideration by the knights, Gary was awarded a black belt. This gave him quite a surprise, knowing that he had produced the best results in the tests. Before he could even appeal, Sir Winford simply handed him the belt with a smile. He was visibly disappointed not to receive the highest accolade on the belt lineup. Even the other trainees thought that he should have gotten a white belt. Besides, no one even knows what black belts do. Next was Ian, he easily earned a white belt with his monstrous strength and big heart. The goddess of their batch, Sylvia, also received a white belt, while Dan got the lowest, a red belt. Martha was assigned to the green belts, and even Monk received a black belt. After everyone had their assignments, it was now time for Ray's. Everyone was certain that he would get a red one, of course. He strode through the hall and onto the stage to get his belt. After careful deliberation by the knights, he was also awarded a black belt. Now it's official that Dan is the only trash red belt in their dorm. Even with Ray performing so poorly, he was falling deeper into despair with the knowledge that he's the weakest here. No one was more confused about Ray receiving a black belt than Ray himself. He reckoned that there might be a conspiracy behind this. All the belts had been given out, and the results were final no matter what. Starting tomorrow, they would be undergoing training from different knights according to their belts. While everyone was still clueless about their black belts, a man with a very familiar scar could be seen not far from the trainees. He was looking at his chart, where every black belt was listed, including two redheads, Kyle and Ray. He just hoped that they wouldn't get him into trouble. After all, they would be the future Dragon Knights. Bro is a literal Dragon Knight already. The next day came, and everyone arrived at the training grounds, including Ray, Kyle, Gary, and Monk, the new black belt inductees. They were getting impatient that their instructor hadn't shown up yet, they could only hope that the guy was at least normal. After saying that out loud, their instructor finally arrived to hear their complaints. From now on, this chain-smoking, scar-faced, and carefree guy would be their instructor. They awkwardly walked behind him without a word, creating a very tense atmosphere. Kyle broke the silence by asking the others if the instructor even mentioned his name at all. So, without any hesitation, the outgoing and straightforward Red Baldy asked the knight how they should address him. The guy casually waved and introduced himself as K, just K. As they were making their way to their destination, they accidentally ran into the hateful Sir Delbert by coincidence. He pitied Kay for having two red hairs in his lineup. He then turned his attention to Ray, telling him that he would not even be inside this academy if it were personally up to him. Ray would not back down against this clown, though. Just a little clapback from the kid visibly angered the clown, threatening Ray that he would be keeping his eye on him. But that kind of threat would not fly anymore, as Sir Delbert barely dodged a blade coming at him. With a puff of smoke, Kay wanted to make something clear from now on. Ray Talon is now a member of the Black Belted Knights. It wouldn't be good if they let discrimination cause bad blood between factions. Kay is low-key a ride or die for the Black Belt Dragon Knights. But this clown just would not stop running his mouth, thinking that Ray is a scourge or something. He insisted that everyone will find out that the prophecy is wrong sooner or later. Delbert the Clown was then forced to retreat to his hidey hole with a scowl. As for the prophecy that he was yapping about, the kids had never even heard of it. But Kay could already feel a headache coming his way at this rate. He had just instructed everyone to follow him. They finally arrived at the place where they would be having special training every day from now on. Right as the entrance was opened, an ominous wind greeted them with a foreboding feeling. 
so intense that even opening their eyes was difficult. Their vision slowly adjusted to the dark feeling inside, and they finally saw what the place was. It was so decrepit to the point of ruin, with thick dust and cobwebs all over the place. They went inside, and Sir Kay immediately vanished. No one even noticed how and when he disappeared. To add to their horror and unease, the massive gates behind them suddenly closed with a slam. Confused in the dark, Ray decided to use his dragon's eye to investigate, but Sir Kay was really gone. Even with the use of his formidable dragon's eye, he couldn't see traces of the guy. Given that he had the most extraordinary sense out of them all, it was safe to say that the others were confused as well. Sir Kay then reappeared behind them with a threatening presence. The scenario was right out of a horror movie. Sir Kay explained that from today onwards, they would be training in complete darkness. They would further their abilities while polishing their senses. They would do this until the day they became one with the darkness and turned it into their sharpest weapon. Gary chimed in with a question. He wanted to know if it was true that black belted knights would be dispatched on assassination missions in the future. Kay admitted that all of them had the abilities that made them more suited to carry out assassination missions than others. That's why they were here. But Gary was bothered by that. He wanted to fight fair and square like the others. But they were all chosen because they were special compared to others. Kay assured him that if he wanted to fight fair and square, then he was free to do so. There was no need to feel worried. The knight then gave each of them a black strap with a scream as a watch. From today on, they were trained to fight however they liked to fight. The screen displayed Ray's information, ranking, and training completion rate. He is currently ranked 300th in their batch. According to Sir Kay, the rankings would be renewed every day after practice. Students of the same grade can also challenge each other. If the lower-ranked student wins, it will take the place of the higher-ranked student. This, in turn, will net them more resources. Find rank one. Beat rank one. Easy profit. In their whole batch, there are about 300 students. That just means that Ray is at the bottom of the barrel. But Gary, on the other hand, is the undisputed rank one. People have been trying to guess who the rank one was, and it turns out to be him. Dan celebrated the fact that he ranks first and third in their batch are his doormates. Sylvia, the rank three, and Martha, at 89, reprimanded Dan for being shallow. As for Monk, he looks happy looking at his ranking on the screen. He's comfortably placed at rank 65 as of now, but he vows to continue working hard. Ten days later, Ray is just getting back from his solo shenanigans. He didn't get to hunt much today, but he's already so close to reaching 100 points for beginner beast crystals. As soon as he got into their room, he heard a loud argument inside. Monk and Gary are in a shouting match after Gary badmouthed their black belt special training, which Monk used to climb up to rank 50. Gary insisted that it was useless, and he can keep his rank 1 status without its help. This is the first time that they've seen the always docile monk so agitated. Dan is also confused by this argument since he doesn't even know how the black belts train. It's true that Gary isn't good at stealth, assassination, and such, while Monk, on the other hand, has shown great talent for it. Gary's not exactly wrong either. He's better than Monk in all the basics, and even though Monk is becoming strong quickly, Gary's still stronger than him overall. Monk is angry that Gary kept on putting down and undermining all this hard work like that. But Blondie is standing firm. Sylvia had to jump in to de-escalate the situation. She even asked Ray for help to stop the bickering. So to stop this argument, Ray suggested that they fight it out. And of course, Dan thinks that it's a great idea. With them fanning the flames, Monk agreed to have a rank battle. Gary is fine with the proposal to see if those skills Monk loves so much are useful in battle. Word of their fight quickly spread across the academy, given that Gary is the first ranker after all. Monk is not too bad himself as a black belt. Some smut morons, namely Sebastian, the youngest son of Delbert the Clown, also caught wind of the news, calling in a fight of country bumpkins from Rennie. Kyle did not miss the golden opportunity to open the bets for the fight of the top star Gary and the dark horse Monk. Dan was his first patron, betting 10 silver pieces on the rank one as if it weren't his friends that are fighting. But even Martha placed a bet on Monk for fun. Sylvia wants to know if Monk has a chance in Ray's opinion. Kyle not only manned the bets, but he will also take on the role of referee and hype man. Redhead Baldy is on that grind set. For real. Ray thinks that Gary has the edge in this fight too. Kyle started the count in anticipation of the match. As soon as the ghost signal was dropped, Monk charged with ferociousness. Gary is gifted and has great technique. He stands out among every student for sure. Meanwhile, Monk has worked harder than anyone else on special training. They are probably the greatest rivalry right now. The stage is set, and their duel is heating up. Out of nowhere, Monk unleashed a downward strike so forceful that it covered the arena with smoke. 
He did everything right, and he thinks that his attack definitely worked. Even the audience watched intently until the smoke cleared, and it became clear that Gary blocked the powerful attack. He warned Monk to just give up, given that he has no chance to win at all. Monk has definitely improved a lot, and Gary has to deal with him with utmost caution. But there's a big but. Ray and Sylvia were sure that Blondie will take the win because Monk just can't fill in the gap within their abilities in such a short time. The kid is persistent, but he's also growing frustrated and impatient with every strike blocked. Gary took this as an opening for his turn. In one clean dash and swing, he shattered Monk's wooden sword in half. In a real battle, this would undoubtedly spell a loss. The arena was silence, and only the drop of the wooden blade could be heard. It's over, but Monk just cannot accept the result. Gary apologized, but this is it, and he believes that this is how it should be. Monk has other ideas, though. He firmly believes that it's not over yet. Ray was the only one that noticed a change of atmosphere surrounding him. With his splintered wooden sword surrounded by a peculiar force, the kid targeted Gary from the back. Their roommates yelled from the stands to stop the fight. The enhanced splintered blade came close to Gary's neck, and he felt that ominous feeling. I can say this with full confidence. Monk is tripping. Man. Someone grabbed that incoming attack with just bare hands, causing blood to drip down. Everyone watched in shock as everything happened so fast. Of course, Ray was the one who stepped up to the arena to stop the incoming splintered blade and pulled Monk out of his trance. Realizing what he had just almost done, Monk let go of the blade and apologized profusely. He was so fast just now that Sylvia could not even catch the movements, and yet Ray managed to get up there in just the blink of an eye. That was the more incomprehensible feat here. Monk repeatedly apologized to Gary and Ray for losing control of his emotions and acting rashly. If Ray had not stopped him, it would have been undoubtedly worse. But with the stoppage of the duel, the audience and betters were confused as to who won the match. Kyle addressed the audience to calm everyone down. Since someone had stepped in, the results would not count, and everyone would get their money back. This did not go over well with the degenerate gamblers in the audience, as they started throwing things at the people in the arena. Kyle tried his best to solve the situation to no avail. It did not take too long for them to turn the blame for the stoppage onto Ray, calling him names and throwing dangerous stuff onto the stage. A stone hit him in the head, and it definitely looked like it hurt. In just a second, the audience turned on them as if they had done a horrible deed or something. Monk stepped up to protect everyone from the deranged audience, but the mess quickly spiraled out of control. They had nothing to do with the earlier match anymore. Ray just wanted to go with his head bleeding severely. The duel had already ended, but this rabid mob just wanted something to be angry about. Of course, Sebastian and his goon would not miss the chance to escalate the situation even further with a solid brick. Thankfully, someone saw that in the goon's hand and shot it off. It's good that Monk managed to stop the commotion from getting out of hand, but he also earned the anger of the goon. And it's not only that, even the smug Sebastian was annoying that he did not get to be a horrible person today. The words red-haired freak continuously echoed inside Ray's mind. People who wanted him out, people who wished he shouldn't have been born, people who blamed every misfortune on him, and people who dubbed him a walking disaster and wished him death. He just does not know why things always end up like this for him. He hasn't done anything wrong to warrant this treatment from these filthy humans like this. Every insult dug deeper and deeper into his primal soul. Hearing those venomous words, it was almost as if he was being enveloped by a wave of toxic sludge. Curse, freak, die, trash, useless, idiot, fool, die already. Each word scratches his humanity away bit by bit. His inner dragon wants to come out and reverse the insults. Humans, they are the ones who should die. As a human, I stay go for it. Before he could lose control, someone came onto the scene and demanded silence. It was Sir Winford who strode through the deranged crowd, commanding respect. Ray has been bleeding a lot and needs to be healed immediately. Sir Winford will help him with that. But he refused and just asked if the knight needs him for something. Winford is here to inform Ray that his mother is here at the academy. This news was certainly out of Ray's expectations. She was received in one of the nicer rooms at the academy. Hearing the voice of her son calling her mom immediately caught her attention. Ray could not believe his eyes. It's really his mother. It has been a while since they have seen each other, and Ray has definitely grown up. Ray does not want to talk about himself. He wants to know if his pops got better since she's here now. But she just ripped the band-aid off and informed her son that his father is gone. But he's not dead yet, that's not what she meant. His dad left the house and the village. That should be impossible though. He's been confined to his bed since he was infected, and now, she's telling Ray that he left. Sir Winford already knew that this would happen. 
but he couldn't bring himself to tell Ray the truth about the Plague of Shadows. Those who are infected usually die within a year. Jack was a special case. But in the end, strong survivors end up becoming slaves of the Shadows to spread the Plague further. There has never been an exception to this sickness. She only learned that day how much Jack had fought against the Plague of Shadows in the past decade. Back in their house, she was woken up by a noise coming from the dining area. The familiar infected feet could be seen beside a bottle of ink. Jack had risen from being stuck in bed for the past decade to write a letter. He turned around to see and called his wife's name, Scarlet, after such a long time. Seeing her husband awake, she almost couldn't believe it, jumping on him with a big hug. But fate is crueler and more complicated than that. Jack thinks that he can't control it much longer. He wants her to kill him immediately. Even though it's hard and she can't bring herself to do it, she must kill him. The play of his shadows is starting to flare up and take over his entire being at a fast rate. He's losing his mental faculties, and Jack is slowly being taken over. When asked what was wrong, he started to transform into something far from human. Jack is turning to something dangerous at a rapid pace. She was left crying on the burning floor of their home as the remnants of Jack's mind continued to ask her to kill him. She's overtaken by grief and pain, unable to move an inch. Jack looks more like a monster rather than a husband and a father. He's just yelling for the fast and sweet release of death from his wife at this point. In the end, she just couldn't do it. Jack is her husband, and he's Ray's father after all. Clutching the letter Jack had left for their son, Scarlet knew she had to deliver it personally. Jack's regret for not being there during Ray's formative years was palpable. The moment he and Scarlet laid eyes on their son, they sensed something truly special. Jack, aware of Ray's acceptance into the Meg Academy and his tendency to hide his strength, couldn't contain his pride. He longed to apologize for his absence and hoped Ray would live the life he desired. Gratitude welled up in Jack for having Ray as his son, and his love for the boy remained unwavering. As Ray absorbed the letter's words, a torrent of emotions swept over him. From witnessing the darkest aspects of humanity earlier to feeling the immense love from his father, he made a solemn vow to find a way to save his dad, no matter the obstacles that lay ahead. Ray went back to the dorm room to process his emotions first. His mother decided to find his father for now. She would look for him no matter what he becomes. Ray wanted to go with her, but she insisted on letting him take his own path as this would be what his father wanted. Scarlet is just so glad that she got to see her boy again after a long time. She reassured him with a tight hug and a reminder that he should just focus on what he should do. It has been a decade, and he feels like he has not done anything. He has not improved in the slightest, and he has never felt more human. He could not take revenge for his race, nor protect those he holds dear. Right now, everything just sucks. He's just like me. For real. Gary went in to check on him at the dorm room. He heard that Ray met his mother earlier and is already back in the room. Gary wanted to know if Ray's father is alright. Of course, the kid would clam up and not tell his friend what was happening. Gary knew this. He knows that something's definitely off. Jack's letter got blown by the wind and fell to the floor, catching Gary's attention. He took the paper, wondering what it could possibly be. But another person just went in the room. Dan took the letter from his hands. He thinks that since Gary was looking at it so intently, it must be a love letter from some fangirl or something. Dan was just goofing around, wanting to read some passionate love confession when the rest of their doormates arrived. At that moment, they noticed that it was actually addressed to Ray. Everyone was surprised and confused by this, especially Sylvia. After reading the letter, Gary explained Ray's and his family's situation. They did not know that his father was infected by the Plague of Shadows, and that he had such a rough childhood. They decided that from now on, they will treat Ray better. Even just a little bit, everyone felt Ray's burdens. He went to cool off in the cafeteria after going through some extremely tough stuff for a kid. Sylvia and Martha went by his side to invite him to eat together out of nowhere. This is the extremely rare depressed Reese. Back in the dorms, something similar happened too. Someone had folded his clothes and blankets neatly on his bed. Dan and Ian showcased their terrible acting skills, insisting that Sylvia took care of everything for Ray right here. This string of nice things happening to him is just bizarre, and he's confused as to why these guys are acting differently. The very next day, he spotted Gary placing some freshly picked lilies on his bedside. Gary thought that seeing freshly picked flowers would help brighten things around the dorm. A look of visible disgust appeared on Ray's face while he considered that Blondie might have fallen in love with him. Ray wanted to ask us for a while, he's been noticing a shift in how his dorm mates treat him. Something is definitely up. Gary then confessed that he accidentally saw the letter. He apologized for treading on his friend's privacy, knowing that he shouldn't have looked at all. 
Fairy also did not tell the others to come and look together, but it already happened. Blondie admits that it's his fault that everyone found out, and he's sorry. Instead of being angry, Ray had a genuine smile on his face in a while. His doormates are the best. As the two were having their bro moment, someone came rushing to the door as if it were a life and death emergency. They are carrying a severely injured monk, barely hanging on. Everyone is stressed and worried for the kid. It turns out that this was Sebastian's doing. He provoked Monk into getting into a rank battle with him. Typically, rank battles should end immediately once one side surrenders. Monk should not have gotten hurt to this extent. According to them, Monk had already passed out and he hadn't had the chance to surrender yet. But the brat did not stop and he kept on beating poor Monk up. Everyone saw that the beating was definitely on purpose. With his last remaining energy at the moment, Monk weakly called out to Ray. Due to his state, he apologized for not being able to help Ray with his bed for the next few days. Seeing Monk be this considerate boy while under pain made Ray snap. The kid's limbs are fractured, and they urgently need a doctor. Without saying a word, Ray turned around and headed for the door. He was going to get some much-needed revenge for what that rat brat did to Monk. Gary chased after him to urge him not to be rash in how he would approach this issue. Gary also wants to get back at them for Monk, but it's complicated. Ray, on the other hand, believes in an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. They need to tread carefully because Sebastian is from House Delbert. He's the youngest son of the fraud clown, Sir Delbert, so they can't carelessly get on his bad side. Ray could not care less. Knowing that the guy started it all, he should also pay for his actions. But this is not the brat's first time doing something like this, he's practically untouchable in this academy. The worst case scenario is Ray might get expelled for this. But Ray assured them that he's not that dumb. He'll go through the proper channels and beat the guy in an official rank battle. Bro is about to make the biggest rank jump ever. Gary and Sylvia are still extremely worried for Ray, though. We see the training grounds of the white belts, and it's vastly different from the black belts. Sebastian is roaming the grounds like it's his own backyard, while the other students are diligently sparring. Ray made his way to the site, and the scrubs immediately barred him from entering with extreme prejudice. He ignored these lackeys and asked where Sebastian is. Their boss never talked about having a red-haired friend before, so Ray wasn't permitted entry. Ray does not give a flying freak, though finally, Eric, Sebastian's number one fanboy, notice what's going on. The Nooblings inform the number one glazer that Ray is looking for their boss. Of course, this guy would be extremely rude while talking about manners. He's angry that somebody is interrupting their training as if they're good or something. This guy is yapping and yapping even though Ray couldn't care less about whatever he was talking about. Amused, Sebas came forward and introduced himself, asking what Ray needs from him. Seeing that he's wearing a black belt, Sebas correctly assumed that Ray is here for his friend. That makes things faster, there would be no need for small talk. He then shot him a direct invite for a battle request right there and then. Seeing his rank on the screen, everyone around just laughed, and even Sebas just dismissed the invite. This smug brat was convinced that it's not going to be much of a fight, seeing that Ray is miles lower than him in rankings. Sebas initially thought that Monk was strong, but he easily pummeled him to a pulp. Sebas gave a blatantly funny apology for hurting Monk. He reasoned that the kid lost badly because of the natural gap between peasants and his kind. He said that he did not want that to happen again. So he disrespectfully shooed Ray away like a bug. But it seems like his number one henchman has another idea. Sebas might not stoop down to Ray's level for a fight, but he would not mind doing so. This Eric kid is currently ranked 9th in their batch. So, if Ray can fight and beat him, other people might be interested in a fight. Of course, this guy would need his brat boss's approval before proposing a proper duel. Sebas doesn't even care, so they can go ahead. Ray wanted to know if he can fight Sebas if he wins against this hot-headed mini-boss. The brat is not promising anything, but they can talk after a win. The surrounding white belts celebrated, seeing another fight again. People come for challenges every day in this side of the academy. Ray confidently gave Eric the first move to come at him. He has not even unsheathed his sword or anything like that. Eric wants to use this moment as a chance for him to show off his stuff. He wants to use the thing that Sebas taught him. Brat Boss is watching on the side with an amused expression as he expects his goon to bully a little kid. Eric is coming in full swing with an intent to deal massive amounts of damage. He tried to unleash a sharp stab. A rageous side stepped his move like it was nothing. This kid was already shocked from that exchange alone, as if dodging that flimsy attack was not the easiest thing in the world. But it's not over yet, he's not giving up. He swung downwards in multiple angles, daring Ray to dodge it, and he did. A chop upwards was easily sidestepped to the right. 
and a wide swing was negated by a lean back with eyes closed. This kid just has ultra instinct. This is the fastest that Eric can attack, and he's still getting shut down at every angle. And just as he was falling into despair, Ray gave his system a restart with a single punch to the face. Eric lost his grip on his sword, and maybe in reality as well, as he flew to the wall of the training facility. Unconscious and humiliated, goo number one quivered on the ground. Now that he's dealt with number nine, sending him to the infirmary, he asked Sebas if he's qualified enough to fight now. But this brat is still not sold on the idea. He wants to know what he will get in return if they fight. That was easy. Ray pulled out and put up two intermediate beast crystals on the line to raise the stakes. Even for the likes of this rich brat, intermediate beast crystals are still a luxury, but Sebas is worried that this might be dirty goods obtained from something shady. Ray used the excuse that his parents are adventurers, and they left these crystals for him. The rat brat can still take these crystals from him while he hasn't used them for equipment. Stebas finally accepted the challenge, but he has another condition. He wants this ranked battle to be held in public for all to see. That is what Ray wanted in the first place. Stebas wanted to show everyone that he did not take the crystals by force or something. They went to the arena, and it did not take too long for the audience to pour into the stands to watch the match. Kyle is back with his trusty coin box for the bets, worried about Ray going up against the second-ranked guy in their batch. He thinks that Ray is just doing this to earn a quick buck by selling the match or something. Kyle would be happy if Ray even manages to give the brat a nosebleed at the very least. He then went to do his gig, riling up the crowd to bet on the upcoming match. Even Ray's roommates are not showing too much confidence in his chance of success in this fight, except Sylvia. Dan teased her that she's only thinking like that because love makes people blind. Sylvia insisted that it's not the point, people are just blind if they can't see how strong Ray really is. Gary is on the same boat, instead of worrying if Ray would win. He's more worried about the blowback from that clown Delbert after the match. Sibas opened with a speech, the children of knights will become knights, and the children of farmers will become farmers. He firmly believes that no one can surpass the boundary of class. He thinks that Ray just became a little more confident after beating his goon, but he wants to show the difference between the master and the number two in this fight. They've only just started, and this guy is already nagging Ray non-stop. They both took their positions, and Sebas is sporting that signature smug and overly confident smile. Like and subscribe to see some rich brat beatdown. Ray's friends held their breath as the countdown for the match started. It looked like our boy was going all out as he donned his mask, resembling the black belt dragon knight training that he was. The battle finally commenced, and Sebas was the first to charge with his blade. That initial collision almost made Gary's heart stop due to its intensity. However, it appeared that Ray easily dodged it, and Sebas, being the brat that he was, thought that this kid had just gotten lucky. Not only did Ray dodge, but he also unleashed his own attack, drawing a shallow cut to draw first blood. Seeing how small the cut was, this loser actually thought that Ray could only do so much. So, Ray asked him why he talked so much. Perhaps he had won all his battles using that mouth of his. In typical rich, spoiled kid fashion, Sebas was easily provoked to charge once again. He kept using the same predictable move, so Ray simply sidestepped it with ease. Now, that one attack earned him two quick counters, and this time they were a bit deeper. Dan didn't even see Ray's attack, and Ian missed it as well. Gary was the only one who could see what Ray was doing. He couldn't help but wonder how Ray had learned that dodging method. Upon closer inspection, Ray's movements were identical to those of the premier dragon knight, Sir Kay. Stebas, the brat, wouldn't hold back now, he enhanced his combatabilities to see if Ray could dodge again. The audience noticed that the brat was now using Chi, converging it onto his sword. Bro thinks he's in Dragon Ball, it looked like this fight would be quite something to watch after all. But even with powerful Chi covering his weapon, technique could trump it all. Ray could easily dodge these attacks as if the enemy were in slow motion. But Sebas had learned from his mistake and baited this dodge precisely. He was going for the second part of his combo to take Ray by surprise with a slash. Thankfully. Ray managed to raise his wooden sword in time to block, but this exchange gave Sebas some confidence. From here, Blondie would go at it with relentless ferocity. Almost everyone in the crowd was rooting for him to beat up the red-haired freak. This reversal deeply worried the Rennie folks in the stands. No matter how you looked at it, Sebastian was going too far. Gary and Sylvia were the only ones who could see what was happening clearly, and they were not worried about Ray. Steam blood drip onto the floor next to his bright white shoes, the one who was really at a disadvantage here was Sir Delbert's moron son. In the few times that Sebas rushed to attack, not only did he never land a clean hit, but he was also riddled with painful cuts all over his body. 
Now that everyone was seeing what was really happening, they only became more confused, as Ray was just dodging. But to a trained eye, you could see that our boy was constantly on the offense. Every time he dodged an attack, he would counterattack at least once. He had been continuously chipping away at the poor villain's flesh and stamina. Blondie's bratty tendencies were starting to surface, complaining that not even his father had beaten him like this. With his cheek convergence pushed to its limit, he mindlessly charged once again. That's when Ray decided to take the first strike with a slash straight to the face. People were starting to see a glimpse of how strong Ray really was. He had a chance to win immediately, but he had been dragging the match out on purpose. It looked like he wanted to torture Sebus bit by bit. He had been playing with the idiot, just like an apex predator plays with its prey. Ray is just built different like that. With his face slashed up with deep gashes, the spoiled rich kid in him surfaced even more, calling Ray a dirt peasant. But Ray only wants one thing, proper revenge for his friend, Monk. And he's going to get that, no matter how bloody and messy it gets, with his wooden sword in hand. If you complain about your face getting hit, it's just going to get hit more. This time, it's a broken nose. This brat is just itching to rat on his equally trashy father to punish Ray for ruining his face. Even his subordinates could not help but cringe at this show of humiliation. But during this short match, Ray became convinced that talking to someone like this kid is just a waste of his time and energy. As he raised and swung his wooden sword, Sebas tried to plead for him to wait as he wanted to forfeit. Before even having the chance to forfeit, Trashy Blondie is already eating another sword slap to the cheek. Ray wanted to make sure that the son of a gun wouldn't be able to forfeit that easily. He still hasn't gotten the proper revenge for Monk. Ray Beach slapped Sebas from left to right repeatedly. As this continued to go on, everyone knew that this would be bad. The only thing that was able to snap Ray out of his murderous slapping rage was the voice of his buddy. Monk got out of bed and rushed to the Coliseum to stop Ray from making the grave offense. Out of all people, he did not think that Monk would be telling him to stop. That distraction for a moment gave Sebas the chance to forfeit before becoming even more unrecognizable. The match is ended, and Ray Talon wins. As soon as the duel, or the slaughter rather, ended, Ray got out of there. The goons went up to their humiliated master to take him to the infirmary. Stebas does not want any pity, he does not want to get treated. All he wants is vengeance against Ray Talon, who wants to see who will have the last laugh. This kid really needs his head checked up. At the Avrian Knight Academy Central Building, someone annoyingly familiar is expressing their inability to forgive Ray for what he's done. Sir Kay, on the other hand, is firmly on Ray's side. From a knight's perspective, the young man did not break any of the rules. Sir Kay's primary message is a reminder not to disregard the rules, especially to Delbert. He strongly emphasized that if Delbert truly believed Ray had ignored the rules, he would have taken immediate action and killed the kid, punishing him for disfiguring his son. His hater level has to be studied. This audacious knight is presenting the case to the elders, arguing that the young man acted deliberately as if he were destined to be a menace. One elder finds Delbert's words not entirely without merit. The prophecy holds true. The red-haired boy will bring about the kingdom's destruction. However, the prophecy also suggests that the red-haired boy might be the chosen savior of this world. Nevertheless, based on what they've observed, some elders are concerned that Ray has already shown signs of becoming a calamity. Thus, caution is essential. While expelling Ray might seem like an easy solution, they remain uncertain about the consequences. It could potentially trigger their downfall. The head elder intervened and put an end to the fruitless debate. If everyone had differing opinions, they could resolve it through a vote. Those in favor of Ray's expulsion were quick to raise their hands, with Sir Delbert being the first. Elder Gibby and a master knight named Rose followed suit. Surprisingly, even the head elder voted for Ray's expulsion, alongside Elder Vaughn, who was wearing a COVID-19 mask. As for those opposing Ray's expulsion, the kindly-looking Elder Humphrey was the first to raise his hand. Sir Kay, Bernardo, and Winford also stood by Ray's side. In total, three were in favor, six were against, and two abstained. The motion to expel Ray Talon did not pass. While he was being sentenced by the higher-ups, Ray was relaxing on the dorm roof. He felt cozy and comfortable until a sweet and familiar voice called out to him. It seemed like she had been searching for him everywhere. Ray had just wanted some solitude for a while, but Sylvia wanted to ensure he was okay. No, he was thinking about Monk. They weren't even that close, but this girl seemed to understand what was on his mind. Sylvia had been wanting to talk to Ray, but she struggled to find the right words. She knew he was different from most people. He wasn't skilled in conversation or in understanding people's emotions, and Ray didn't really care about all that. It appears that Ray misunderstood Sylvia's intentions. 
All she wanted to convey was that despite everything, she was certain that he was not a bad person by any means. Whenever Sylvia sees Ray confused or upset, she can't help but wish she could assist somehow. She wants Ray to trust his circle a little more. After all, they're all friends. The mention of friends in particular left a bad taste in Ray's mouth. Suddenly, he turned around and pushed the shocked Sylvia against the wall. He wants this young woman to see his dragon eye. He wants her to see that everything positive about him isn't true. But deep inside, Ray wants to know if Sylvia is afraid of him after witnessing this inhuman side. She admitted that she's afraid of Ray at times, but what she said earlier remains true. Sylvia does not believe that this red-haired kid is a bad person. And now that she's had a closer look, that inhuman eye of his looks rather pretty. She thinks it suits Ray well. From now on, she simply wants Ray to stop treating himself like a monster. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the winning waifu. This was not the response he was expecting at all. Even after witnessing his inhuman side, this girl still did not view him as a monster. Every time Ray thinks he has grasped the essence of humanity, circumstances change immediately. One thing is certain, he still has a long way to go until he truly comprehends what it means to be human. Meanwhile, the meeting on the top floor of the central building did not go as Delbert had anticipated, so he stormed out in anger. He no longer cares about the prophecy he will someday kill that fiend, Ray. But before he could walk away, one of the elders chased him and called out to him. It was none other than the extremely suspicious elder Gibby. He had come all the way out here for one simple reason. The elder had taken note of Delbert's opinion that knights should only come from noble blood. Suspicious elder Gibby found that intriguing, and he was curious about Delbert himself. It seems that something is brewing within the upper echelons of the Avrian Knight Academy. Sylvia made her way down from the roof and out of the dorm when a person with lustrous blonde hair cordially asked her if Ray was there. Sylvia gladly directed the guy upstairs, where Ray was staying. The blonde hair of this handsome boy is quite familiar, but he's just too charming and sway with his words and actions. Even Sylvia only realized that this person looked recognizable, but he was certainly not from their year. I would recognize that dirty hair from anywhere. The roof tiles creaked, and Ray naturally assumed that Sylvia had returned upstairs for some reason. However, he was greeted by a blonde, handsome young man with a smile, holding two wooden swords. This guy introduced himself politely as Harry or Harry Delbert to be precise, a second-year student. Upon hearing that introduction, Ray stood up, and the mention of the Delbert family name automatically annoyed him. Harry confirmed that the one Ray had defeated earlier was his little brother. Ray naturally assumed that this guy had come to seek revenge. However, Harry immediately dispelled that assumption, clarifying that it wasn't his intention. He wasn't here for anything so petty. In fact, he wanted to thank Ray. Harry knew how arrogant his little brother could be and that Sebas had never practiced earnestly in the past. He knew it was only a matter of time before his brother would be defeated, so a bit of a beating for a lesson was a good thing. If there was nothing else, Ray told Harry that he was leaving. But there was no need to rush. They couldn't have a ranked battle because they were not in the same year. But Harry wanted to teach Ray a lesson as well, all with a bright smile. After all, he still had to do something as an older brother. Ray actually accepted the wooden sword without a fuss. All that talk, and Harry was essentially here for a fight too. The pretty boy insisted that he just wanted to see how strong Ray really was. Now that he had proposed the duel, he also wanted Ray to take the first move to show him what Ray was working with. Ray did not like going on the offensive from the get-go, but this guy gave him a different feeling than everyone else. So, for this roof battle, he would gladly make an exception. His first strike was casually blocked by the pretty boy's one-handed wooden sword. Not only that, but a fierce stare kick-started the release of a powerful aura, coating Harry's wooden sword. This came as a shock to Ray. Feeling that dangerous presence, he decided to immediately retreat. Harry praised him for making the correct decision on the spot. For Ray, this was a strange new feeling. Usually, his opponent's sword would have already broken after that first full-powered attack. Bro is fighting armament hockey users now. Ray changed his grip to a more primal style. If this continues, his sword will break first. Harry commented that it's obvious Ray doesn't know how to use Chi yet. If our boy can't win based on pure strength, he will try to do so using the black belt techniques from Sir K. His relentless attacks were praiseworthy even in the eyes of a more seasoned trainee. But if that is all he's got, then Harry won't even break a sweat dealing with him appropriately. No matter how good he is when it comes to black belt techniques, nothing's working. To retaliate, the pretty boy is going to show him how big the gap is between them. A single stab was unleashed and Ray was able to block it, but the impact lifted him up into the air. The force was so strong that it almost knocked him off the dorm roof. Once he managed to halt his momentum, some internal damage caused him to painfully throw up blood. 
Looking at the trembling kid, Harry looked disappointed that they are going to end here. But given that Ray is clearly out of commission already, the prayed boy decided that this will be it for today. But before Harry could make his way downstairs, Ray painstakingly lifted himself up to ask a question. He wants to know if this long-haired blondie is the top-ranked second-year night apprentice. Harry just lightheartedly laughed at that question and revealed that he's not the top dog. In fact, he's just a middling 50th ranker in his batch. That reveal opened Ray's eyes to the disparity in strength between him and other people. He was trashed by rank 50 so easily. Harry left with a proposal to fight again after Ray can use Chi properly. This thing called Chi looks like he'll become stronger than ever if he can learn and master it. Make sure to like and subscribe to see Ray's next training arc.